morning and welcome on the Sunrise Safari. It is a dark and ominous morning, but exciting to be back out on the vehicle. My name's Brent Leo Smith. I have VM, aka the Wildebeest on camera, and we're in search of Africa's big cats. So, uh, thank you to John and Chris Rogue who mentioned there might, there was a leopard, sorry, who walked down this very road in front of me, but at about eight o'clock last night, so good couple of hours ago we're gonna go see if we can find any tracks with a little bit of rain we've had it can make tracking a little bit difficult uh, the rain compacts the soil and becomes very very hard and the animal that treads as lightly as a leopard becomes one of the hardest things to find but that's half the fun also there were lions roaring in the east before I went to bed last night so hopefully they've managed to meander their way west onto Juma private game reserve where we are at the moment so, very exciting. We've got a, a, a new presenter trying out, uh, Brett Hawley, uh, a good friend of Scott's and mine. So, very excited to have him. But uh, for now, you're stuck with me for a little bit. We're going to go across the, the water holes wall here and go see if we can find some tracks on the other side, try to figure out where this leopard's gone. Well, John and Chris Rogue and whoever else might have seen it, uh, can you let me know whether you think it's a male or a female? And that'll help uh, me look for tracks. So there we go. Before I even ask, Chris Rogue says she thinks it was a male, looked like quite a big cat. So hopefully uh, it could be Tingana and he hasn't moved too far. So some welcome rain last night. Oh, the night before, sorry. So thank you for all the concern. Uh, about my well-being and good to be back on the vehicle. Don't worry, it's just a little bout of tick bite fever and compared to malaria, it's nothing. And I've had malaria 29 times. So a lot, it's gonna take a lot more to keep me off the vehicle. So let's go out and see if we can find uh, some cats. Well, those are Impala, those are not cats. So, uh, for those of you who might be new, and we haven't been doing too much in the dark, I won't shine my lights on an animal like an impala. And I'm also going to turn off my lights as we go past them. And there's a very important reason for this. So your nocturnal animals, uh, their eyes are designed in a different ways, so that the light's not such a problem for them. But with your daylight animals, if we leave a bright light on them, it can blind them, cause them to be blind for up to five to ten minutes and that makes them easy targets for predators. And we are here to observe, not to interfere what happens. So you can't really see in the darkness here, there's three Impala rams that are jogging along. They are making, a bit further away, so they are making it a little bit difficult for me to see tracks. And let's have a look, the ground's quite hard, but let's have a squiz. I'm always going to have to find a spot where there's a bit of soft mud. Uh, the road's very hard at the moment. And obviously in this low light, even these wonderful lights we have, it's going to be quite difficult to see a track. So this is where operating in an area on an extended period uh, and knowing a little bit about animal behavior works. So if it was a male uh, and his tingana is a about three routes he uses regularly. So I think we're just gonna meander along the route that he would most likely use and, and see if we find any tracks or even better, we find him. So uh, from one bee to another, uh, guys, it'd be nice to Brett, it's his first drive. And so let him introduce himself to you. So we're going to go across to Mr. Hawley, and so he can bid you a very good morning. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Safari Live. My name is Brett Hawley. I'm joining you for the first time, as some of you know, and it's a privilege to be out here. Thanks, Brent. Uh, old friend of mine, Brent, and I have been guiding for a long time and it's great to be out here with him this morning. I've got Andrew on camera and uh, Andrew I last bumped into in the Kalahari filming meerkats. We went to the same school together in Johannesburg so what a pleasure to be out here. 
I hope we can entertain you. Uh, I know that there was a leopard seen on the waterhole camera last night. So we're going to have a bumble around and see if we can find any sign of it. It's good to be out here with you. Let's see what we can find. Difficult for everybody. I'm uh, Brett with a double T. I'm rocking it with Brent. Leo Smith with a B R E N T. It's the double B's on drive this morning. It is going to be confusing for you all out there. Uh, no, that was a comment from Gene. So thanks, Gene. You can just call us B. of you out there wishing me good luck thank you very much i need it as you can imagine i'm feeling a little bit nervous and i've had well wishes from all over the world so i really appreciate that thank you very much anna marie it's uh we can't see the sun yet i think it is starting to creep up towards the horizon it's quite overcast out in the south and east the night after full moon, there was a very big moon last night, beautiful and bright. Didn't need a torch to actually see. The moon is still up in the sky in the western horizon. We're heading kind of southeast right now, and we'll have to have a look what the weather does. A big bank of clouds sitting out there. Great weather for a leopard to be moving. You can see there the bank of clouds. It is the middle of summer and nice to have the clouds around. We expect it to get quite a lot warmer on these days, so it's nice to be wearing a jersey early in the morning, a jumper. Thanks very much for your message on Twitter. You're right, the big catch two bite, and uh, thank you for being nice to me. <laughs> it's great to be entertaining you this morning. Out here in the Sabi Sands, always exciting. The best part of early morning drive is the unknown. It's my favorite thing about safari. People often ask, you know, how do you do this every day? But it's these early mornings which really is it you don't know what's around the next corner when you get out of bed you have no idea what the day holds and that's an exciting part of this morning you just never know so we're here crossing this drainage line south of the dam the leopard was seen last night. As most of you will know, leopards' favorite places, these dry riverbeds. We're going to have a look around here and see if we can't find any sign. Cat, thank you for your kind welcome. I appreciate it. Um, you asking, do I have a favorite animal? It's a, it is a hard question, I must say. Um, something I've thought about a lot. I have two favorite animals. Uh, the one is the honey badger. Uh, it's now become famous commercially all over the world. But through experiences over the years, I've come to love that animal some fantastic videos out on youtube now if you type in honey badger you, you get a real idea of exactly what this crazy animal is all about i also love leopards uh, i love looking for leopards the challenge of finding leopards 
uh, of course, combined with their beauty, uh, but it's, it's the challenge of finding leopards, which I really love. And just to kind of add in a third there, I'm not sure if that's fair, but I love elephants, you know, watching elephants for entertainment. Uh, tell us what's your favorite animal, Sox Cat? And uh, Julia, thanks very much for sending your your questions through. Keep on sending them from all over the world. I think you're both in the United States. Tell us a bit about you. So let me let me just uh, introduce myself a little bit. As I said, um, went to school with Andrew, our cameraman, who's right behind me here in Johannesburg. And uh, I loved the bush from an early age through my family, my parents uh, visiting the bush, a passion for birds, nature, conservation. And my whole life I basically knew that I wanted to be a safari guide. This passion was burning inside of me. Uh, people often tell me how lucky I am that I knew what I wanted to do. And I don't really know why or how. It was just always inside of me that I knew this is what I wanted to do. Uh, grew up in Johannesburg and then headed, headed east in South Africa to the Lofelt. I've been guiding for the past 12 years. This is year number 13 of professionally guiding and have the privilege to work and live all over the continent. I've been fortunate to spend time in Tanzania and in Botswana living and guiding. I've spent five years here in the Sabi Sands further, further south of here and um, I'm based now in a little town called Hootspreit, which is about an hour and a half from Juma, where I live with my wife. I've been very privileged to spend many years out in the field with Scott Dyson, and my very, very good friend. And um, that's me in a nutshell. I am passionate about the bush, quite keen on sports, and um, I love birds. I, I enjoy walking. And that, that is me in 10 seconds. So no sign yet of the leopard. We're going to keep bumbling around and see what we can do. I heard some ox peckers flying over there. I'm not sure if you did uh, back at home, but some ox, pe ox peckers flew over. So they're waking up. The bush is starting to change from dark into light. Almost time to turn the lights off and uh, still great weather with the overcast weather. Things like hyenas and leopards will still be moving around. And then our diurnal animals starting to wake up. So such an exciting time of the morning. Let's see what we can find out there. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining me. It's great to be out here. I'll see you in a little while. We're going to link over to Brent, who's at Buffalo Hook Dam. So with the road being quite compacted after the rain, uh, we are going to think like a leopard instead of trying to track a leopard. So Zim and I are, are checking sort of the normal male leopard routes uh, through Juma. And we're now at, just passing the very empty bottles of water hole. So even with that rain we did have, did not even make a dent. The only difference is I won't be walking across caked mud because it might be a little bit softer than last time and I don't want to give the final control too much joy by sinking into the mud. So just an update for those who are not sure and uh, the Inkahuma Pride have made another buffalo kill but unfortunately it's beyond our Travis area but happy fat lions and hopefully they'll be coming back to visit when they finish that buffalo. So 
Scotty is just giving a shout. He's our tracking. Standing wire Scottish. Just to let you know, I've checked Zoe. Have a nice so there we go, Scotty's checking um, our, our western boundary, seeing if the Kumas are coming across. Uh, he's on his way up there now. How are you Scott? Um, no, I haven't been able to find any tracks of that anywhere that cross the dam wall. Um, I'm going to check Cheetah Cut line just in case it's already headed east. Coffee sounds good. I don't have any luck with uh, the line. Oh, nice. I'll, I'll, I'll try and get on the church. Good luck. There we go. Scotty is checking to see if those in Kahumas have, have, have been very fast eaters and greedy and have managed to put a buffalo in their bellies in a day and be on the move again. It seems like finally then Kahumas have realized that there's sort of no lion competition in this area and all of a sudden they're back and all five girls which is great when i saw them there were only three and uh, we've got some jokers out there who says i wonder if the birmingham boys are going to find the other b boys uh, which is obviously a brent and brent just to confuse matters and uh, <laughs> hopefully they do find us i could do with a male lion or two in my life at the moment just as long as jamie doesn't get jealous This is actually where we saw those in Kahumas for the first time a couple of days ago. I was actually with them and they killed that young buffalo just up here. get malaria 29 times. Mike, mostly my stupidity. Uh, most of those is when I was sort of under 23, 24. And you consider yourself to be immune to most things and bulletproof. Uh, so I used to work very deep in the Zambian bush. And uh, only get, used to get let out in town very short stints. And town for us was a wonderful town, actually one of my favorite little towns in Africa called Livingston, which is the Zambian side of Victoria Falls. And uh, at sort of 20, 21, 19, and uh, after being in the bush for three months, we tended to have a little party when we got into town uh, and tended to run around without shirts on and not put mosquito repellent on. So most of the malaria was definitely our fault. Uh, Zambia has got one of the highest uh, area cases, reported cases in Africa. And most of those are actually from Zambia and most of it was from my stupidity. I get it far less these days because I tend to spray mosquito spray and sleep with my mosquito net down. Uh, in South Africa, malaria is not really a problem. Uh, very low risk malaria area, although it does theoretically occur where we are at the moment. It's a very, very low risk area. If you go up to Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia, Congo, Gabon, and places like that, it's far more high risk. But sort of in the last couple of years, I've only had malaria two or three times, so a little bit more sensible. Not much, just a little, but enough to know when to put the mosquito net down and when to wear a t-shirt. leopard tracks here and I'm not sure where that looks by the tracks next to the tracks I think Scotty showed these to you possibly sometime yesterday and they've been circled but I can see the footprint so there's Scott and that's a Scott footprint there in the light and a, a leopard track to the left there we go Uh, 
a very good morning to the twins in Colorado. Hello, Michael and Andrew. Uh, welcome on the back of the game drive vehicle with myself and, and VM. Hope you guys are having a great time and their favorite animals are leopard and cheetah respectively. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to find one of those for you guys. And yes, guys, we're really live since I'm answering your question. And don't be scared to ask me another question. Hopefully I can let you know about whatever you're wondering about in the bush. And if uh, I know the twins know how to ask questions because they've already sent one through. Uh, but if you're out there and you're new and you don't, uh, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And then I'll answer your questions. So we've come up to the eastern boundary and I did hear lion, male lions roaring in this area. Um, so hopefully the b-boys have come to see the other b-boys. Uh, other than that, because uh, that leopard was seen so early last night on the, on the Juma cam, I unfortunately have a little bit of a sad face because if it was Tingana and he does stick to his normal routes, he's probably crossed up eastern traverse boundary. Hopefully, Aubrey uh, and Taxon are out shortly. They drive out of the Juma Lodge. And so, I'll tell you what Scott's saying now. So, the Vuyatella and uh, Gallagher Lodge vehicles have a much bigger traverse area than we can. And uh, even though sometimes we can't get to the animals that they can, uh, we are able to get updates so we know what we're looking for, where the animals are, uh, how they're doing, so it's always useful. But at the moment, we're up earlier than everyone else, so as you can see, it's only Brett, Scott and myself out at the moment, and uh, we're out on the far eastern boundary. I know Scott's just called in male leopard tracks crossing into Vuyatela uh, or Montejuma, uh, but I think that's possibly the same tracks. Uh, of the animal that crossed the dam wall. So if we stick to Tingana's most regu regular path, we might cross about a couple hundred meters ahead. So I'm sure there's a little bit of confusion um, uh, Jill's very worried about are one of us leaving. Why is Brett here? Uh, and is he taking anyone's place? Uh, he's not, so your your normal presenters will stay as we are. Uh, we are just looking to expand slightly, so it's always good to have a pool of great presenters to call on. So we're going to be testing quite a few presenters in the next couple of weeks. So be nice to them, guys. But so uh, don't worry, none of none of, none of us are leaving. And uh, speaking of new presenters and testing them, let's go test out Brett. Welcome back everybody. Andrew and I are still bumbling around having a look. It is a beautiful morning. We found no sign of that leopard. And so we're just going to continue in the area and see what we can find. But uh, great to be out here. The dawn chorus, the birds are slowly starting to call. Well, let's just have a listen to that. Michigan, great to hear from you. Thanks for sending through. Uh, you're also a birder. Welcome to the gang. Uh, I uh, worked out yesterday when I was out with Scott. A lot of you have lists, which is fantastic. I've got a list for Southern Africa as well. Last year, I did something called a birding big year. Not sure how many of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's for people who are crazy and have lost their minds and have money to waste. There is a great movie out there, Jack Black and Owen Wilson, and what we did last year, my father, my best friend, his brother and his father, and our associated girlfriends and spouses, 
We did a big year. We tried to see how many birds we can see in Southern Africa. It was a lot of fun. We did a load of traveling. And um, what I wouldn't have said in the beginning of the year is that these city slickers actually beat me. I came last. My father's just finished his birding big year uh, last week, actually. I came last. Can you believe it? Anyway, I have to take them all out for dinner. So I've told them I'll take them out for dinner, but they need to come and visit me first. I, I saw 537 bird species in Southern Africa. My best friend, I taught him everything he knows. He saw 578 bird species. In Southern Africa, at the moment, there's about 958. And it was an amazing effort to see that many birds in Southern Africa. Uh, Mary, I hope I can see, uh, find you some more birds this morning. We had the Birchall starlings calling when we went quiet there. The Birchall starlings. Let's just have a listen. There were a couple of Birchall starlings that flew across the front. I think you saw them. Another one flying across, across the top of your screen. That's the Birchall starlings with the kind of squawky, screeching calls. There's a kingfisher calling in the back. Andrew's up onto the dead tree. There was a Birchall starling there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a starling, darlings. It's now flown off. The Birchall's starling. You just kind of slide forward. There's an oxpecker, which many of you are familiar with, sitting on the dead tree to our left here, see if Andrew can get in there. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. So Andrew's going to slowly go into yeah, red-billed oxpecker. And that could be his home, actually. The Birchall starling and the red-billed oxpecker are both hole-nesting birds, and they both use natural cavities. So unlike woodpeckers and barbets who actually excavate their own holes, these guys either use something which a woodpecker was using last season, or in that beautiful old skeleton of the forest, the dead leadwood tree, which is a great place to find these natural cavities. And th that could very well be the oxpecker's uh, nesting site and roosting site. They will sleep in there on a nightly basis. Many, many birds just build nests in order to breed. But these uh, red-billed oxpeckers actually sleep in their nest every night in a natural cavity. Now, the problem with a natural cavity is like, like that is that they are very, very popular. It's not only Birchall starlings and red-billed oxpeckers who like those natural cavities, but it's also snakes, lizards, squirrels, all kinds of things who are competing for those same homes. Now, the red-billed oxpecker, as I'm sure many, many of you know, is the first bird that a guide should learn. Uh, the noise of it and the behavior, it's a great indicator out in the bush. He's just waking up. I think he's hoping for some sun on that branch. It's still going to be a little while before the sun pops out and joins him there, warms him up. He'll be waiting for his friends, head off and find a rhino to eat some ticks off of. We've got a question from Sammy in Texas. Sammy, thanks very much for joining us. And you're asking, how often do we see a Malachite kingfisher? Um, great question. And they are around. They're actually a common bird, but often overlooked. Tiny little thing. Let me find it in the book for you. Malachite, some of you know, is actually a color. The Malachite kingfisher is one of the most beautiful birds we see in Southern Africa. But very difficult bird to get your eyes on, actually tiny little thing, uh, very shy and often flit off uh, as soon as you see them. They sit low over the water, so always associated with waters. Some of them are actually not fish eaters, not Pisivorus. Um, let me just find the kingfishers in the book here. And the other half do eat fish. So... Malachite kingfishers associated with water, 
Um, and very, very similar to the pygmy kingfisher. Pygmy kingfisher's got some purple on the ear. Here I've got the, uh, the book out. And you'll see in the top right is the Malachite Kingfisher. Such a beautiful bird. The book here is saying 14 centimeters, 17 grams. Tiny little thing with the most beautiful coloration. Lovely red beak associated with waterways. They sit kind of two, three feet above the water. As soon as you come near them or on a canoe, uh, they, they fly off very, very fast flies. Difficult bird to get a picture of and the most beautiful. We don't see them often. We, we see more the pygmy kingfisher in this area, though the pygmy kingfisher is a, a migrant. And as it says here, the pygmies are breeding intra-African migrant. This is the pygmy kingfisher over here with the violet cheeks. And that's the main difference between the two birds. They're very similar in color. Pygmy kingfisher is an insect eater found further away from the water and in our broadleaf woodland and the malachite kingfisher found around the water. So apart from the violet on the cheeks, also if you see a small tiny little kingfisher near the water, you could guess it's malachite and away from the water you could guess it's pygmy. In our winter, down here in, in, in the southern hemisphere, you see a small kingfisher, most likely the malachite, because the, the king, uh, pygmy kingfisher has then flown north up towards the equator. He's only down here for summer. They're around right now. Such beautiful little birds. And so interesting that one kingfisher just eats insects. That's them. Iggy, you asking? They just feed on insects, that's right. The interesting thing, I think many of you are familiar with the Woodlands Kingfisher, and every day the Woodlands Kingfisher will bath. Now the Woodlands Kingfisher is an insect eater, but it's very, very common to see them diving into the water. They're not catching fish though, that specific one, they're just cleansing themselves, cleaning themselves, ridding themselves of parasites. Pygmy Kingfisher, also just eating insects. They get a lot of protein now. Of course, they have been recorded eating fish, but 98%, 97% or so of their diet is insects. That's the pygmy, um, but the malachite kingfisher, fantastic little hunter uh, of fish dive bombing, the malachite kingfisher. Uh, we're gonna carry on a little bit, bumble down the road. And we're going to go over to Brent, who has found some exciting tracks. Let's see what he has. Over to you, beady man. So, uh, we chatted about lions roaring last night. And here we've got the tracks of, it looks like a single adult male lion. And unfortunately, these tracks are leaving our Travis area. But if for every single set of tracks that leaves, one must come in. So, definitely part of the Birmingham boys, so they are around, and... Uh So we're going to keep checking this. On a positive note, no sign of male leopard tracks leaving. So that's always good. So hopefully that male leopard's still somewhere on Juma. We're going to check the rest of the boundary. And if we get nothing, uh, I'm going to chat to Scott and ask him to check some areas for me as well. And I know you've been chatting about birds with Brett. So I know a lot of you keep lists. Some of you might not yet. So I think I'm quite smart recently and I got a new app and uh, it, it lets me keep lists. So just to show you guys, I'm starting a live drive list and there we go, it says Juma and, and you can see, so there's nothing on the list. So those of you who want to start a list today, today's a good day and we can start it together. And so I'm having a new list of only the birds we can put on camera live on drive, not the ones we might glance at while we're going past. So we're gonna keep our eyes open for our feathered friends. And I think I can hear the first one of the list shouting away, the Woodlands Kingfisher. He's calling up ahead. It sounds like he could be in this big uh, green thorn or Balanites up ahead. Happy, happy, because it's been some rain. Do you spot him yet, Vildi? He's behind. 
good actually, it sounds like. Just need to be on the radio for a second. Oh, no, he is in this bad enough. Um, no major updates yet. Uh, remember that shot that I'm on at 10 o'clock last night? I'm not sure which direction I get it from there. And also, he spotted me. I thought that anyway, yeah. heading northwest. I'm on our path, it's worse. I'm always one of those funny ones where he's shouting away and you just can't see him. Okay, go for it. Yeah, also, uh, not yet, and the other is still on watch. I'm not sure if I'm going to go on a crystal patrol or not. Anyway, oh, we'll keep going, see if we can okay, find okay. another one. I'm just trying to find an easier one. An easier one, there we go. There are quite a few around, so get ready with those lists. And you know what? Let's start on a more challenging species. Why let's, well, let's not start on one of the more common ones. Let's start on the more obscure. Okay, I just did it. Welcome back, Austin, who's 13. Nice to have you with us. Austin, Austin, I'll be back with you in a second. We got those male lion traps that look quite fresh. You can hear a squirrel alarm calling, so let's very upset squirrel. I can't see any predatory birds. And I'm just gonna be Oh, it's very upset. I'm trying to spot the squirrel and we're trying to see where it's looking. You see the squirrel there, Jim? Yep. So cool. And beautiful sky behind, the clouds highly mobile. But that is a very upset squirrel. So you often hear different levels of alarm call. Now that level of alarm call means whatever it's spotted, it's close. But with a squirrel, it could be a mongoose. It could be a snake. Or it could be... A big male lion, you never know. That's why it's always worth checking. I'm just going to let Aubrey know about those lion tracks. Aubrey, Aubrey. I'm on your Morning, Aubrey. It's Brent here. Just to let you know, there's Wanuna uh, Island Gonzo that cross east at Central Junction, uh, Chile Cut Line. Let's just sneak on a bit, and while we do that, we're going to answer Austin's question. So Austin's wondering about male lion coalitions or, or prides, and Austin's saying, well, are there others apart from the Birmingham's that we see? So at the moment, Austin, no. Um, there is a possibility we might see the Salati males from time to time. But what happens with male lions is they can control such a vast area. You can have a group of male lions, like the Birmingham boys, for example, are able to control such a vast area. They can have four or five different prides of females within that area. So for now, with the Birmingham's taking over, it's unlikely we're gonna see other groups of male lions. But again, that can change in a heartbeat. That's the joy, of, the joy and heartbreak often of the African bush. kept quiet, I can't see anything. I was secretly hoping for a leopard there, the way it was really aggressively alarm calling. What a beautiful fresh morning after the rain. The dust's down, it's a very clear, crisp morning. says, well, the squirrel must be going, Brent, help, Brent, help. And uh, those of you know, VM and I only help in Yalas, and only when they jump in the car. But uh, no, I, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I really wish I could speak squirrel. Uh, I have worked with some incredible trackers over the years. And one tracker in, in particular, James, has actually also worked with him. And he can 
it speaks, bro. He can tell you whether a squirrel's alarming at a bird or a leopard. And I can tell you whether it's upset, or sort of upset, or not so upset. But, but a guy by the name of Renius and Klongo can literally say, ah, it's a leopard, it's a lion, it's, a, it's an owl, it's a, it's a bat and leopard. You can actually almost, oh dear. I oh, know it's not, it's only a hyena, thank goodness. thought it was you know, some hyena tracks. Hold on here. It's always important to check these you know, hyena tracks there and there. Um, it's always important to check these big intersections of roads. They are often thoroughfares for a lot of the, the, the cats. But so far, so good. No leopard tracks leaving Juma. Saying it's such a beautiful, crisp morning. Well, chatting about squirrels. Mike in Florida is wondering, have I ever seen a leopard chase a squirrel up and down a tree? Mike, I have many times. Oh, excuse me. Normally it's uh, leopard cubs or, or, or youngsters. And while their mom leaves them, they entertain themselves by chasing everything. Squirrels, cesticulars, wax pills, Franklin, dwarf mongoose. And uh, I have seen leopard ch a young leopard chase a squirrel up and down. Fortunately for the squirrel, most of the time, uh, the leopards and experience pays back in their, their dividends for them and they manage to disappear down a hole uh, before the leopard can get to them. Thank you to Debbie, who's from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, says, I'm glad I'm feeling better. Me too, Debbie. I feel remarkably well now. Uh, and she's wondering. Sorry. Ah, just up there. Oh, look, here we go. A little bit of male Nyala displays going on here. Philo erection is what it calls it, is when they erect that crest. Uh, Debbie, I'll get back to the rest of your question now, but look at that. So, male and Nyala have a very interesting battle strategy uh, compared to something like an impala, who will lock horns with an opponent. Uh, male and Nyala, to try and avoid that physical confrontation where uh, either individual might get hurt, and not to say that they don't actually have physical battles, it's, it's less likely though. So they have a, they have a, to quote a Zoolander, they have a walk-off. So he's not too serious about his walk-off now. There's uh, two other males around. He's just practicing, I think, for the, the real deal. There's no girls around. You know, he's going back to feeding. So he'll wreck that man. And oh, there comes the next one. Is he going to see that? Wrecked his man. And not walk like that, like we saw initially. Really stiff legs. Try and make themselves look as big and as impressive as possible. And uh, I know a lot of you guys often see this on the Juma Dam Cam. And uh, I'm going to give you a little insight about how to tell which one wins. So when we see, when you see them doing that, if there's two of them and they're erect, the one who's winning the the walk off or the I'm prettier than you are competition is the one whose tail is extended up, showing the big white. So that's the, the more dominant normally. And oh, look, there we go. See, there's a bit of dominance display going there. So in Yala, unlike a few animals are non-territorial and you will find groups of males together. And the only time they really, really battle is when there's a female in estrus. But there is this constant hierarchical displays like we're seeing at the moment. You see that scratching of the ground, pawing, and that is a dominance, dominance display over the other male who's closer to us. Also, putting your horns in a tr putting his horns in a tree and shaking it about, another another sign or display of dominance. There we 
go. Nearly did it. I was hoping he was going to do that. Drop his horns into that little bush as well. And he's a very big male. And you can see he's got beautiful big horns. And you see the sort of almost white tips to the horns there. Uh, it's a sign of age. And obviously the older and bigger the male, the longer the white is in the horns. And for those uh, viewers who might be a little bit new, occasionally uh, people have been known to do the Nyala dance. And uh, if you'd like to see what James and I look like while we're doing the Nyala dance, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. But uh, on that, uh, a lot of you are wondering where James is. James is taking a well-deserved break. He's been on holiday. That's why you haven't seen him on drive. Don't worry, he is coming back, unfortunately for me. But he is coming back, and he'll be back uh, in a couple of days, actually, probably about a week or two, a week or so, and James will be back on the drives with the rest of us. And uh, I can con he can continue to torture me, and I can continue to torture him. Obviously we have Brett, who's um, having his interview drive today, and Mr. Chen in Texas is what do you tell a new presenter uh, to help him get ready? Well, basically just, I think, be yourself, and uh, a lot of thing that took a lot of us a lot of time to get to, as you see, we've got this, uh, this little, if you come down here, we've got a little monitor here uh, that has a look what the camera's looking at. And if you're not used to it, so it's, it's very important. It's probably one of the most important things to learn as a presenter is watch your monitor. Uh, because if I'm looking over there, but VM's got the camera over there, I'm talking about something that's not on camera. So I think from, from our point of view, that's probably the, the most difficult thing to get used to is watching the monitor, especially when you're in a sighting. Instead of, there's a leopard right there, all you want to do is look at the leopard, but you need to look at the monitor. So we can explain what's going on on camera. I think that's probably, for me, the biggest point. Other than that, I think the type of guys we get here um, and the type of guys that are coming in and view uh, are great guides and great guys, so just be themselves. Don't, don't try to be anything you're not and watch your monitor. Speaking of great guys and great guides and watching the monitor, uh, let's go across uh, to Mr. Wardy uh, so he can give you an update. Welcome back, folks. Uh, Andrew and myself, we've spotted a, a lion track here this morning. I hope that you can all see it. In right in your screen is the paw print of a lion here going down the road. So I've just had a look about the last five minutes, trying to work out how fresh is it, how many lions are there. I'm sure many of you at home now are wondering, how do you know how fresh a track is now? The interesting thing this morning is that we know it rained the night before last. So what happens the night before last is that everything gets wiped away a clean sheet. Any tracks that we see on the roads this morning and yesterday, we know are from uh, pretty recent because of that rain. So what also happens after the rain though, you think it's very easy, but the sun comes out yesterday and it bakes the ground. Further around the corner here, where I was looking, you can't see a single track. And that's because the ground has been baked hard. After the rain, the sun comes, gets very hard. Anything walking on top doesn't make an imprint. We've got some very nice soft sand, and we've got what looks like a single lion track here. It is very difficult. What we've done with the vehicle is position it facing straight into the sun. That's the best way to look at tracks, to put the track between yourself and the sun. I'm just going to remove this leaf here. Hopefully not disturb it too much. You can have a look in the uh, lion's tracks. We have four toes. There's a toe over there, and there, toe over there, and there. Four toes. I'm not very good at drawing. It's not one of my skills. So bear with me here. And then in the back of the pad, some of you might know, a lion has three lobes. Now outline the back of the pad. There's one lobe there, another there, and a third lobe there. Lions and leopards have three lobes. So that's pretty much the, the lion paw that we're looking at. It is definitely from last night, from what I've seen. How do I know that? What I'm looking for is other animals, other creatures having walked on top. 
further down this road, the, there are hyena tracks which have walked on top of this lion track. What does that give us? It gives us a bit of a timeline. Also, in this, in this frame over here, we have hyena tracks. There's a hyena track over there, and there's a hyena track over there. That track is headed towards the sun in the eastern direction, and this track here, this hyena track, is headed in a western direction. So quite interesting. We're just going to draw an outline of the hyena track here. Also four toes showing in the track. The toes are a bit of a different shape, more crescent shape, and the lines round. The, the difference really lies in the back of the pad. This is quite soft sand. And it doesn't show that well, but there's two lobes in the back of the hyena pad, and there's three lobes in the back of the lion pad there. Quite a nice size difference. We've got a lion track there and a hyena track there. They're both going in the same direction. They both walked here last night. Further down the, down the line, we get this animal's footprint on top of this lion's footprint. So I know, okay, the lion walked before the hyena. If I work, walk further down and I find something like a civet track or a bird, let's say I find a dove track. Now I know a dove is a, is a diurnal animal and that's going to tell me, okay, the dove only woke up probably in the last half an hour, started moving once it was light, so the lion moved here before it was light. Looking at these tracks, I'd say it was during the middle of the night. I only see it tracks of one animal, which is quite interesting. It, uh, it's difficult to, to gauge the sex of this animal, but it looks to be a female. So what we're going to do is wander down the road a little bit and see, see what we can find further to, to tell us a little bit more. Uh, see if we can find where this animal has walked and what the further story is. Nice for all of you to see me out the vehicle. I am taller than Scott and uh, let's see what we can find down the road. See where these tracks have, have headed to. So I'm sure many of you are wondering now why would a lion be walking alone, a, a, a lioness? It's not something unusual. Often they move out or between each other. There could be another track here that we've missed. There could be another female lioness walking somewhere parallel with this one. So let's just move down the road and see what we can find if there is further sign. There's, as you look down the road while I was talking, I'm not sure if you saw, there's a lot of hyena tracks, a load of hyena tracks. Of course, there's a lot of hyena activity in the area with the den sites, but lot of activity maybe the lion and the hyenas have all smelt something the sun is now out bank of clouds has disappeared it's going to be a scorcher here in the sobby sand today beautiful as we look down the road difficult to see but there are a lot of hyena tracks quite unusually so they're going in both directions so just telling me really to keep an eye out and see if we can find something interesting. The tracks I'm looking down at now, some of them are, are really fresh. Where the hyena has walked, it's tossed up some moist soil and the soil is still dark where that hyena has walked. So he walked there this morning. The hyena tracks are going in both directions. Of course, we don't know, did the hyena come this way first and then come back east or was it the opposite way around? Uh, you like that little comment? Although I'm taller than Scott, he can do a couple more push-ups than me, but only a couple more. Uh, Gail in Calgary, nice to hear from you. Thanks very much. Uh, you're saying I've got a nice haircut and maybe I can inspire Brent. I agree with you. It's going to take a lot of hard work um, for to convince Brent to to cut those locks of his. He believes it's good luck. He actually said yesterday that he, when he went to the doctor, he thought about cutting off his hair, but he's worried he's going to lose his mojo. Maybe we will uh, give him a little haircut later.
by Joyce in Pennsylvania. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for sending through your question. Just an update. This one set of lion tracks is still headed along this road straight towards the sun. Joyce, you're asking, how do I know Brent and Scott? Well, it's a very small industry. We always say it's a small world, but I'd hate to paint it. Um, Brent and I, we were talking about it last night. We met probably about six, seven years ago. I went to a new lodge for an interview. Brent was there and Brent took me out. I, just want to, uh, I don't want to lose concentration here at this junction. So we'll just stop and then I want to have a look at those lion tracks. And Brent took me out and uh, he had those locks of his. They look just like they are. I actually bought him some scissors yesterday. So maybe we'll cut it and um, he took me out for an orientation drive. It didn't take me 30 seconds after I met him to know this is the kind of guy I want to be with in the bush. I'll never forget, he got out, we, we, we drove along the Mozambique border of Kruger Park, got out and followed a hyena drag mark. And that was my first, the first few minutes that I met Brent. We followed where a hyena had dragged an impala for about three kilometers through the bush in the Kruger National Park. So uh, ever since then, you know, it didn't take me long to know this is a guy passionate about the bush who who I can hang out with. So ever since then, Brent and I, we live in the same small town. It's hard to miss Brent in the shops there. And uh, we hang out a lot. We have the same interests and likes. Scott Dyson and I have done many, many adventures. We met at a lodge just south of here in the Sabi Sand, Singita, and um, we just connected. You know, we, we, we have a similar friends group. Met a few years ago, but it's like I've known him my whole life. Scott and I have, have done some amazing adventures together. We just clicked. I think it's uh, it, it, probably because he knows I can rugby tackle very well. Scott is an amazingly talented sportsman. We have the same interests, passions, and and it, it's been amazing to actually have Scott here yesterday afternoon. I just want to thank him, you know, for prepping me for this and, and getting me into it, giving me a lot of advice. Scott and I have been to the Kalahari, the Kalahari National Park, always looking for animals, tracking, taking photographs, having adventures. We've slept many nights in a tent in Kruger Park. Uh, we've been down to Natal. We've We've done loads of fishing together, and um, I'd just like to say thanks to Nikki for uh, guiding Scott in the right direction. So I'm just going to jump out here and have a look at these lion tracks and see where they've gone. And um, looking forward to many adventures with Scott, actually. We are talking last night on his next leave cycle. I'm going to, much to Nikki's delight, we're going to go find a place to sleep in a tent somewhere. It's really hard to see this track. The sand is soft here, but the uh, male lion track looks to be coming across. When I compare it to the, I'm not sure if you can see this hyena track here. No, you can't. Um, but I was talking about the difference in color. Let me move further along. Um, can you see this one over here? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if you can see it from there, but We've got this light colored sand. If you see when I dig there, it's very much darker sand underneath, okay? If you look carefully at this hyena track, at the back here is the light, and there's some darker sand, sand like this, which has been pushed out in the front. That hyena walked here very, very recently because what happens, and even though it was a night, it is still warm, and the sand starts to dry out. So we've got the sand on top, which is a light color, and the sand underneath very dark, where the hyenas walked, I've got dark sand, which is a, it has kicked up. Where the lion walked, it's all light sand. The dark, moist sand from underneath has, has been on the ground for long enough to be exposed to the, to the dryness, and it has then changed color and become light again. So we know the lion walked quite a long time ago. The lion has walked straight across here, much more recently um, the hyena walked here. So. It's definitely now I can see at this big junction just one single lion uh, moved east, but early in the night. I'm happy to say it wasn't the night before because that was rained. It would be much more imprinted in certain areas where I've gone through. It didn't imprint into the soft sand, which was wet. So it walked here last night, but early last night. We all know lions can move a very, very long way. Um, he could be far away, but let's keep on 
keep on bumbling around and, and following these tracks and see what we can find. I just want to check with Andrew that I'm not going to drive into the wrong place, but being that familiar with the cut lines. You are going to drive in the wrong place. Let's okay, perfect. So it looks like this lion has gone east onto a neighboring property. We'll just update them and let them know. Uh, come through Juma last night. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it was a single lioness. Of course, I could be wrong. Um, and off, he, off she goes, possibly to join the Nkahuma pride or could even be a nomadic animal. That's the beauty of being in an open system like this. You just don't know. Uh, you, as I said earlier this morning, you don't know what's around the next corner. And you, although you, many of you are very, very familiar with the lions and leopards around here, you just don't know. A, a, a nomadic lion could pop up, could move through this area last night, a cheetah could pop up. That's the excitement and the beauty of being part of the Greater Kruger National Park. So off the lions go east. Nice to see the lion tracks and uh, let's bumble on. from Janice in Canada and I think earlier also uh, everybody's very keen I said I went to school with Andrew it's fantastic to be out here with him and uh, just amazing that I, that I did last bump into him I last saw him at school 13 years ago then in the Kalahari filming Meerkat and here we are following lion tracks down the road in the Sabi sand anyway everybody wants to know how I know and all the good stories about Andrew Scott and Brent unfortunately this is a clean show Lots of children watching and I can't give away any secrets about Andrew. I will say that I saw some, Andrew was showing us some phenomenal videos last night that he's put together on his, on his computer. Obviously, you all know because you can see him film how talented he is and that whole editing side of things is just incredible. I know he knows how to use a computer and it was amazing to see Andrew and what he's done last night with the editing of, of their trip videos of their trip to Zimbabwe. Unbelievable. And um, again, drawing is not one of my skills and neither is playing on a computer. So it's amazing for me to see these guys put this footage together. So uh, no nasty stories about the boys on the first morning drive. I'll uh, maybe, maybe next time. question from Kathy. She's asking how odd does it feel to be presenting in front of a camera and it is odd. I know even having talked to Scott last year, uh, I'm used to driving around a vehicle with a whole lot of guests on the back so I was certainly worried about you know how do you do it and the quiet times and that but it's been fantastic and, and and getting questions from all over the world from all of you is way better it, it you know I, it's basically like having a thousand people on your game drive rather than six so it is it is something to get used to i hope i'm looking at the camera nicely i'm lucky to have a nice message from scott above the lens and um, andrew behind the camera and nikki in in my ear so it, it does feel different and different to having people on the back it takes a lot of getting used to I'm not used to being in front of the camera and it is kind of awkward but it's fantastic to have you all here on game drive it's something I've been excited about for a while and, and it's a it's a pleasure and a privilege to be driving you around the Kruger National Park and having a thousand people from all over the world on the back of the vehicle this morning so thanks for your question Kathy I hope that explains it it feels kind of awkward but I'll get used to it. Okay, the sun is now out. Woodlands kingfishers are calling. Good morning, Ro 
know me in Ohio. I'm not sure it's morning for you, it's morning for us. And thanks so much for your question. You're asking how many times have I driven around Juma? And how long does it take to get used to the area? I'll say one thing, there's uh, nothing, nobody has ever lost, just temporarily disorientated. Uh, I have not driven around here many times, but as I mentioned earlier, I have been guiding for 13 years, a lot of it in this low felt area of South Africa. And what, how that helps is that I'm very familiar with the habitat and the vegetation. So as we drive around and learn a new area, we use natural landmarks. People often say, oh, but there's no signboards around. The thing is, the bush is our signboards. And for Andrew and myself, this marula tree out here on our left, that means something to us. Maybe one day we saw a leopard there it looks in a different form to the others you'll see we're driving past a whole load of marula trees on our left here and i don't just see a tree there i see a marula i see a specific shaped marula so it is like a sign for me or a big termite mound or a fallen over tree so we the bush has lots of road signs you just need to be aware of them now being familiar with the vegetation really helps and being familiar with the area really helps I, i've driven around Juma a few times i was very fortunate when i was young we used to come to a farm here called buffles Hook with my family and one of south africa's very very best safari guys Let's say. And that was a privilege. He was one of my mentors. One of the people when I was six, seven years old, and I looked at this man driving this Land Rover in his car keys with his camera and his rifle, calling birds with his mouth and tracking leopards in his short shorts, I thought to myself, this is what I want to do. That was Lex Hess, right here on Biffles property, right next door where we are. And and here I am, 13, well, actually, that was 25 years ago. And, and here I am doing that same thing. And I, I, I saw Lex Hess last year, and I actually told him, you know, you were the one who made me do this. And that was literally just a stone's throw away from here. So although I haven't driven around Juma many times, familiar with the area, uh, and friends helping us out this morning. So, some of you know Lex Hess, and a mentor of mine, somewhere who influenced my guiding career. And um, yeah, I, I know a lot of you are very familiar with the roads and the area, so feel free if you see that I'm driving into the wrong place or I'm lost, let us know, please. Give us a little suggestion. Let us know where to go. Area you'd like to check out this morning. I need you to help me with the directions. Let's go over to Brent and have a look what he's up to. So, we are sitting here and I decided we were gonna start my bird, Juma Live Bird. This is an obscure bird and it's so obscure, I don't even know what it is yet. Um, initially, I thought it was a pipit. I might think it's a lark now, but what we're looking at is very distinct eyebrows and light on top of the eye and on the back of the eye. And because the sun is behind it, it's very difficult, but to me, the legs look pinkish. And it's not the most common lark we get here, which is the Rufus Nape lark. So I am busy trying to trying to find the call that matches it. That's not it. Oh dear, this is a really obscure one to start with. So if you guys have any ideas what this little lark might be, it's either a lark or a pippet. It's a very pretty call. I'm thinking it's more of a pippet than a lark would be my guess. A bit taller. Now, it's very difficult to see some of the, the legs and legs in these birds is a really important sort of distinguishing factor whether it's got dark legs or pink legs. This is a 
but I'm listening to this now, trying to... Oh, sitting... I okay, guess definitely not that, we can stop that. So he's sitting right on top of a little uh, buffalo thorn, and uh, we're trying to figure out what he is here. So Vim and I have been looking carefully, and I think with the camera, you guys even get a better view than I do in my binoculars. But I'm still, I'm still, I'm thinking pipit. Uh, and the problem is some of the pipits, some of them have such vastly different calls. Almost, maybe, or maybe a monotonous lark. Maybe my larks are a little bit rusty, so let's try a monotonous lark. A monotonous lark, because think about it, is, the, is that call a little bit monotonous? A little bit, it repeats himself quite a bit. That doesn't sound anything like this, does it? So there's often different type of calls. So this is the call from the aerial display. This is not what we want, we want... So just now there'll be the call from perched, and that's what we want. Uh, <laughs> Steph is just driving, he says, back out, back out. So, Steph, you can hear that audio in Final Control. What do you think it is? Uh, so it's for me. It still it still has a more of a puppet shape than a than a lark. Just a little bit taller. It's it's such a distinct call. I can't. So Ian Sherwin says African puppet. Ian, I looked at an African puppet, and we'll have another look at it now. But the call for me for an African pippet is, I mean, if we could just see the leg color, and I'm thinking it's pinkish yellow. So African pippet is actually what I went to first. It does have, it does have the streaky breast, and the problem, it does have that sort of white mustache. Now we're trying to look, if we look at the, the, the tail and the outer tail feathers, Again, this light makes it quite difficult. So we're trying to see for an African puppet. Oh, and he's gone. So an African puppet has white outer tail feathers, and I didn't, I didn't see that, which is, which is worries me. You see there, it's got those um, white outer tail feathers, and I didn't see that. And Melissa says Sabota lark. Melissa, I, I know the Sabota lark quite well. I don't think it's a Sabota lark. And let's just try to listen to the... See, the call for me is wrong. Is there that? Well, it's going to have to remain a mystery for now. We're going to keep going. So how's that? The first, first <laughs> bird we decide to put on camera for my new Juma list, I can't even identify. But that's what excites me about being in the bush every day, is that you are going to get stumped. And it's an adventure, it's a challenge to try to figure out what everything is. And uh, if everything, if you knew everything and everything was the same every day, it would get boring. So exciting stuff. I will try to figure out what it is. says it's a bulbul. I'm afraid that is one thing it most definitely isn't uh, a bulbul. It's just a funny looking branch in the... So just a funny looking branch in the distance there I wanted to check. But yeah, X Ranga said at least it's not flying away. It didn't. It gave us a really fantastic view so it does give us a a chance to identify it. Um, the one thing we can be definitely certain, and I know some of the, the, the birders and twitches out there uh, will love that type of stuff. It is definitely an LBJ, a little brown job. So now it's, and often with a lot of those little brown birds, the call is really important in identifying it. But don't worry, before the end of drive, we'll have it figured. So now, yeah, Africa. 
African pipit does does sort of fit the vibe. A woodland pipit is from Siberia. Again, I, I it, it fits the mold, but I, I, not being able to see the leg color is quite a thing. Um, and a woodland pipit is a good one, Siberia. I'm definitely gonna have to listen to the call. Hello, Cordus. Vim, danger, danger in front of us, Vim. There we go. We've got a, a female in Yala. Uh, for VM and I, definitely the most dangerous animal we've ever encountered, the tuna. <laughs> and there's also some kudu yeah, that's going to roll forward a bit. So we've got two of the spiral horned antelope um, in the same area. Hello, kudus. You see those monster ears sticking out of the bush at us. radar dishes. So could you rely a lot on their hearing? Because they quite often do feed in quite thick areas. So they've got these sort of radar dishes picking up every iota of sound around them. There's a little boy off to the left. His horns coming out. Your spiral horned antelope, your bushbuck, kudu, inyala, and are non territorial. So you'll often find groups of males together, and the only time they really come to blows is when there's a female in estrus. There's that little boy. It almost looks a bit silly with those little horns. If you think about how magnificent and large I can roll forward a bit for you again. There we go. How magnificent the big male's horns are. So let's leave the kudu and Inyala to their breakfast. And uh, while we do that, let's uh, go across to Brett who's got an animal who's as fast as James is on the sprinting track. And welcome back. I know you've just been with the kudu, and as Brent says, this is the one of the faster creatures in the African bush. We've just found an African giant land snail. It's not something you see every day. We really only see them after the rains. I know that many of you saw uh, a snail yesterday with Jamie on the bushwalk. You saw a beautiful one, nice and up close. So let's just have a look out here at the African giant land snail. He was a little bit shy earlier and popped his head back in. Slowly popping the head around. I shouldn't say his either. Really interesting creatures. I'm sure some of you might know they are hermaphroditic, so these snails, they have both male and female sexual organs. Kind of plug into, oh, there he ducks his head back in. You know, he, he was very offended by what I just said about him or her. Sorry, uh, you saw the antenna just pop back in now. As I said earlier, we don't see them very often out and about, and that's because they're very susceptible to predation. And Anybody who sees this guy out here this morning is going to munch them. We only see them after rains, crossing the roads, and we find their, their shells in the bush. When they're alive, they have this beautiful brown color on the shell. There the head pops out. Really beautiful. Interesting creature. It's hard to get a scale of how big that snail is. It's about the size of a tennis ball. It is a big creature. Look at him lubrication underneath just sliding along the soil the african giant land snail now we anybody like a hornbill a jackal even a little bird of prey a mongoose anybody who comes across him is going to eat him it's a big piece of protein inside there one big piece of meat not sure if any of you have found their shells lying in the bush. They get bleached by the sun and go a brilliant, brilliant white color. Very easy to see often as we walk through the bush. You see something white 
and you go over and investigate and it's one of these old dry shells there he sticks his head up having a look around the world now humans also eat them not not in in south africa many many of the guys i've worked with local shitsonga people around here they they don't eat them but people in mozambique do these snails can be very toxic and that is because of all the plants that they eat they eat a lot of toxic plants so what the people there do is they'll find the snail then they take it back to their home alive and they actually let it feed on, on, on plants around their home which they know, or they feed it on grass which they know are not toxic. Those toxins then slowly work their way out the, the snail's body over a period of a few days or a week uh, of, the, of the plants that they've eaten before that and then they eat it afterwards they boil it up it's a big piece of meat inside there the african giant land snail escargot for a main meal and it's an interesting creature to see because we only see them so often you can see the wet trail now left behind by it i don't want to disturb him now it's taken him so long to be confident to cross the road i'm not sure if you can see the trail that he's left behind when tracking you can only see it a little there now. A slug, which doesn't have a shell, leaves one solid trail across the ground. It's not easy to see on camera now, but a, a snail actually leaves a trail, and then there's a piece of dry, and then a, a slimy trail. Oh, we got a fight again. He stuck his head in. Amazing to see how he sticks his head in like that. And interesting, when you're tracking, you can see the difference between the trail of a slug and a snail african giant land snail they do get a little bit bigger than this and he's brave to to be out in the open like this look at it just sliding across there amazing uh, the ability of, of locomotion how they move along like that with no legs we've got a question from wayne in philadelphia he's saying have you ever come across a zombie snail it's a snail infected with a parasite now Wayne, thanks for your question. I have never heard of that. It's a name I think I probably would have remembered if I have uh, heard of it. But if anybody else out there has got some information, more information on a zombie snail, have a look when we get back and see if somebody can give you some feedback. I'm sure somebody on a computer back at home. What I do know, though, Wayne, and this is quite interesting, is we have a parasite which is endemic to well it's not endemic but it's indigenous so endemic meaning it's only found here but it's not it's found throughout the continent we have a parasite called bilharzia or schistomyosis and i unfortunately contracted that parasite about eight or ten years ago what i do know about that parasite is in its form it lives in fresh water and it bores into the shell of snails i do not know whether those snails are called zombie snails here in south africa but it's going to be really interesting to know and i want to know for myself i've done a lot of research on bilharzia because i unfortunately contracted that parasite some years back some of you might be going oh. now bilharzia is a is a well-known parasite it lives in 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 stagnant water which is generally quite dirty from human impact unfortunately in south africa many of our rivers under massive threat from from human impact mostly mines and pesticides and that but but the 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 snails is more from people not having access to sanitation and going to the toilet close to river systems uh, and and that parasite is then moved on they live in fresh stagnant water as i said earlier i do a lot of fishing a, a lot of swimming in rivers and dams because the parasite takes quite a, it has a long incubation stage once it starts kicking in in your body and making you feel tired and sick and not very well 
it's months down the line. And having been in so many different water sources in that period of six months in different African countries, in different areas, I can't say, okay, I got Bilhazia from here. But going back to your question, Wayne, I do know of the Bilhazia parasite. I do know that snails are a host of that parasite, as are humans. They come, they get into you through wounds, uh, open wounds, could have had a little cut or a sore on my leg, which it entered through. There's two main different parasites, two main different types of, of uh, Bilhazia, A and B they call it. I have both of those within my body. The parasites build up, build up. you take a medication called Biltricide, it's very, very strong, kicks it down, and then every few years I can feel it building up, have a blood test and check where, uh, what those parasite levels are in my body. Um, so interesting stuff, I'll have do look out for the zombie snails. I hope they're not running around here. I hope they're not the size of an African giant land snail. But great question being a host of that parasite. Those are freshwater snails, not the African giant land snails. Another question from Guba Walla via YouTube. You're asking, does a snail leave enough of a trail for a predator to come across here and follow that snail? Great question, thanks for sending through. I don't know the definitive answer, but I certainly believe that something like a white-tailed mongoose at night or a black-backed jackal early in the morning, or even now, somebody wandering around, somebody who's omnivorous, who eats everything, who might be hungry, walks down the road and sniffs this trail which we've seen i certainly think it will spark some interest i haven't seen it myself or seen it being documented but a white-tailed mongoose scuttling down the road last night it's a nocturnal creature he will pick up that scent it must certainly leave a scent it's very sticky he's gonna smell it he's gonna be interested whether he knows immediately that's a giant land snail and i've eaten him before and he's delicious it's a big meal and starts following it, I'm not sure, but these animals are curious, they're inquisitive. A lot of what they find is through their nose rather than through their eyesight. It leaves a definitive trail. I, I think that these omnivorous scavengers and predators will smell it and, and follow that trail and find it. Now the birds, which are major predators of these giant land snails, are gonna find it by sight. They don't use smell. The yellow-billed hornbill or a yellow-billed kite or a Wahlberg's eagle is gonna come down and munch him possibly. They're gonna, they're gonna see it through sight. But our mammalian predators and scavengers will probably, will probably pick up that trail through olfactory sense of smell and follow that trail and, and, munch, and munch that snail. So great question, thanks for sending through. The little snail is now in the middle of the road and we're gonna continue. I'm just gonna have to go around him and leave him on his merry way. I hope he finds some cover soon because he is very exposed in the middle of the road. Could become a meal. So we're just gonna skirt around him here. Thanks, Mr. Snail. Mrs. Snail. back to Brent and his luscious locks this morning and he's got another bird for you. Hope you can identify it. So there we go. Um, a nice bird that we can definitely confirm for the bird list and it is a juvenile battalier. There you go, and uh, it takes them about eight years to get their adult coloration, and the tails oh, get shorter as well. Oh, morning ablutions. So well spotted the VM, who spotted the juvenile battalier. And there we go, that's my first official I'm still figuring out, there we go, my first official, official bird um, on the, the, the Juma live bird list. And we go, choose list Juma place Sabi Sands. 
the 27th of the 1st, 2016. Save. There we go. Uh, by the way, with that lock, um, it's very difficult to say, but if I had to sort of be forced into a into an answer, um, it would be that one there. The melodious lark. Um, I don't need to move the screen. Is that good? Really? There we go. Melodious lark. We remember we saw that very prominent um, eyebrow and white under the eye. And also, it had quite a short tail, uh, even though we couldn't see the white outer primaries. And the main reason I say that, because that call is, is, is quite unusual. It does sound almost more like a scrub robin or whatnot. And Melodious Lark is a great mimic. So it could be mimicking another bird. I wouldn't, I'm not going to mark that down because I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to have to go check your screenshots when I get home and have a proper look and see if we can figure it out from there. And hopefully before the end of today and on the Sunset Safari, we can add that for sure. We're heading down towards the main little river system that runs through Juma, the Mawati. I apologize, we're at a cross thread. We might get a little bit of signal breaker. But the main reason is we can't find leopard tracks heading north or, or, or east from where you guys saw them on the dam wall. So maybe they went down the drainage line. So we're going to have a look as we cross, see if there are any tracks. Across the, the drainage system quickly. And there's some buffalo footprints crossing the road. No leopard footprints, unfortunately. So, a very warm safari live welcome to Wilski. Uh, Wilski is a new viewer and likes to know whereabouts are we? So, we'll start in the big picture. We'll see we're in the beautiful country of South Africa. And uh, we're in the province uh, or state of, similar as of Mpumalanga. Mpumalanga basically translated into English. It's a, it's a Zulu, Zulu word. Mpuma means to come out. Langa is sun. Basically, if we, we are translated, it's where the sun comes out. So we're in the east of the country, slightly northeast of the country, uh, not too far from the border of Mozambique. And if we go a little bit smaller, we are within an incredibly massive wilderness area called the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Sorry, guys. I'm just going to see Scotty was calling or something. So Scotty, can you go again with that update? Yeah, okay, another one for the bird list. Another one of our more common species, but a really beautiful little bird. And you can see those little green spots. And uh, it is an emerald spotted wood dove, and off it goes. I missed. Add that to the list. Uh, so, Wolski, well, sorry, back to. So, I said, as we are, we're in, the, in this massive area called the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Um, it is a transfer, transfrontier park that covers uh, three different countries. Uh, so, it's, it's, it's South Africa. Zimbabwe, the Limpopo Park uh, in, in Mozambique, and the Kruger National Park in South Africa. But on the western side of the Kruger National Park, on the southern side, uh, there's no fence between the state land and the privately owned land. We're on the privately owned land. We're in, we come down again. We're in the Wasabi Sands Game Reserve. And if we go a little bit smaller again, we're in the northern Sabi Sands, and we operate on two properties called the Juma Private Game Reserve and Arethusa Private Game Reserve. So we're in, get this, a 39,000 square kilometer unfenced wilderness area. 
There's a fence along the west uh, between the people and the animals, but there's to the east and, and to the north, 39,000 square kilometers. Uh, for those uh, who work in hectares, that is 3.9 million hectares. And I know a lot of our viewers in North America work in that antiquated system of acres, uh, and my maths is horrific. So um, if you can work out for me what is 3.9 million wow hectares and send it to me on questions at wildearth.tv uh, or use the hashtags for alive there is a monster kudu bull so we saw a little boy with his horns just budding out and isn't it incredible that in a few years he could be as big as these guys there's a couple of bulls here you know, having a drink out of the mud wallow that has been filled with the welcome rain. You can see him snooping away. dripping out of his mouth and uh, James 54 on YouTube says what is it like to work in such a beautiful place well James it is absolutely fantastic uh, we are really really lucky oh he's got an itchy head <laughs> he's got his head is too fried on top of his head there and and isn't this incredible you're watching this live with me so you joining me on African Safari wherever you might be in the world and watching this big kudu ball live and look he's even listening to what i'm saying picking his ears up facing them towards me shaking off the flies and you can see him isn't that beautiful and you can see one of my favorite things about kudu is that white chevron across their nose Look how he ducks his horns as he goes underneath that bush. So you can see with those big horns, sometimes when moving through thick bush, it can be quite cumbersome. And you'll notice how he ducks his neck down, puts his horns almost flat on his back. And when being chased by a predator or alarm, he's able to actually move at incredible speed with his, his horns almost flat on his back as he goes through the thick bush. So as we're saying about the spiral horned antelope as we watch them disappear there's some more off in the thickets there is that the males are not territorial they only really become aggressive with each other when there's a female and estrus around and other than that they often you'll find bachelor groups of the nyala and kudu like we've got here we've got two here at the moment but there could be quite easily a few more James 54, it's our pleasure. Uh, he's just letting us know that he's in the UK. Uh, James, as fun as the UK is to visit, I don't envy you. Um, for me, there's not enough of that, uh, which is blue sky. Uh, we've got lots of that out here in Africa. I'm afraid. I think I, I would, I would, I would, I would probably waste away from a from from a vitamin D deficiency if I had to live in the UK. Very much a warm weather and a sun baby. And James, I know you're quite new. I am literally completely allergic to the cold. Uh, and uh, the last time I was in the UK, it was during your summer. And uh, it was probably colder than it is now. And I'm wearing long pants and, a, and I'm just taking off my jersey. Uh, but. I could not believe my, my, my uncle has a, an engineering firm up in Rotherham and uh, the guys who work there, I was literally in five layers of warm clothes and the sun literally broke through the clouds for a split second and everyone ran out and started undoing their overalls to get sun on their chest and I, I literally, I think I had two jerseys, a jacket, gloves and a beanie on. It must have been about 12 degrees. And they were saying, what nice weather they're having. And I thought, you guys are absolutely bloody nuts. I can't believe it. 
but it, uh, it is it does have its benefits Uber Walla would like to know, is an eland larger than a kudu? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, eland is, is the largest antelope uh, in Africa. And an eland is actually a big male eland is larger in weight than a, than a buffalo. So they can get over a ton, over a thousand kilograms. And there are two type, uh, type of eland. Uh, there's a lot of subspecies but a lot of those subspecies are a little bit pushing the limits of taxonomy there but so basically you have your your normal southern or or livingston's eland and then the only really different eland species is what you call a lord derby's eland which is endemic to cameroon central africa and the, the big nyombo woodlands that border the, the central african rainforests there Yeah, I do. I do. I Meredith is being being the comedian on on drive this morning. She says, "Brent, I can have malaria 29 times, but I can't handle the rain or cold." Yes, that that is true. Meredith. Um, see, the other thing about where malaria mosquitoes live, they live in fun places, um, fun places that have lions, leopards, elephants, etc. Um, and most lions, leopards, and elephants, etc., are about as, far, uh, about as fond of the cold as I am. So I tend to keep myself to where the warm places where the large hairies and scaries live. on most safaris you always in search of the elusive leopard and Mandy Olsen would like to know how old does a leopard have to be before it starts climbing trees uh, from a very young age from about a month and a half two months they're able to climb a tree it is a defense mechanism at that stage to get away from hyenas or lions that might find them while their mom's away but they, they are able to climb at a very young age well, since we are doing the live bird list, um, VM has pointed out about 12 to me, and I've, 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 I've fought him. And okay. it's taken off now, <laughs> the one we want to show. Anyway, it's landed again. And I suppose we should get the nice common ones out of the way. And there we go, a Cape Turtle Dove. Yeah, I'm going to go this way, there's three more of them. Yeah, one of them is coming back again. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, right, there we go, look at this. Okay, good. They're actually very pretty birds. One of the more common uh, bird species we do have. And uh, look at them. So they feed mostly on grass seeds. So you see them on the ground uh, moving around and quite often they leave very interesting tracks uh, because they sort of wander around so they're never in a straight line you can always see a dove's tracks that they sort of meander in zigzags and uh, speaking about bird lists um, Christine would like to know what else should I add to my bird list apart from date uh, species and location well, for me, Christine, that's all I do, uh, unless uh, there's a specific thing. So in certain bird species, you have uh, different forms. So you can get menalistic uh, birds, so like a bird that is completely black, or leucistic, where it's a lack of uh, the melanin, and it's, and it's almost white. So unless it's sort of a, an abnormal, I think that's perfect. But say if we saw a, a Gabar goshawk, for example, but we saw a black one, then I'd, I'd add a little note saying a, a, a melanistic or leucistic, or white one or black one. And uh, you can, with the eagles and stuff, so I mean, we 
have seen pale morph warbirds and pale morph tawny eagles on the live drives. So there's something interesting, if there's something quite interesting outside of the fact of where it is. But I think the, the, the date, the location, and the species is just great. Here you go, some impalalas. And with any group of herbivores out here, it's quite often we can add another bird species, but it looks like they're about to prove me wrong this morning. And uh, normally on the bigger herbivores, but sometimes on impala as well. Looking for an oxpecker. There they go, they're actually just arriving. You hear the I oh, no, they're taking off, they decided. The impalas are not good enough, and that's not a good enough view to go onto a bird list. That's a fleeting glance. Okay. Hello, impalalas. I'm going to go check possibly one of my favorite little spots at the moment. Uh, I'm fascinated with soil and water and how it works. And we've got this incredible natural seat at the treehouse waterhole at the moment, which is attracting a lot of animals. So let's go have a look there. And speaking of different animals, here we go. Some zebra. Zebra being a hind gut fermenter uh, always look like they're in good condition. So they always look like they've got a big fat belly. Now this isn't actually the case. It's because of the way their digestive system works, their, their, their stomach is always distended. So the best way to tell if a zebra is losing condition is you look at their mane. If their mane is standing upright and straight, like that one's is, it's a healthy animal. So when they start losing condition, the mane will actually flop down to the side. And then we have them. There's another zebra here and another bird for the bird lists. And I need to move forward a little bit. Move forward a little bit. So we've got them there. It's a little. It's a, what is it? it's a red, it's a red bull oxpecker. An adult. I thought it might be a juvenile for a second. Yeah. And there you can see how short and tight the fur a zebra is. Now, oxpeckers have a wonderful little uh, design in their beak. It's, it's almost like a little serrated edge. The moment this oxpecker is using it to clean itself, but that's how they sip through that very tightly packed hair. So it's a little serrated, almost like a comb. And can be able to comb through an animal's hair to pick up uh, ticks and other mites and ectoparasites. So a fascinating little bird. And then another one for the list. So we're going to see. I think I should actually challenge the other presenters and say, how many birds can you get on a live safari? Because although we often show you and encourage you guys to keep lists, I think we should do the same. Private game is there. Welcome and while wow, there's in Safari Love, welcome to Jessica Woolds. We'd like to know what is the most memorable bird I've ever seen. Oh, Jessica, I've seen some really memorable birds. I think for me, one of the most memorable birds is, a, is actually a little LBJ, a little brown job that goes by the name of an African broadbill. And I'll show you a picture now. And uh, I spent many hours uh, in my youth crawling around the rainforest in Pinda. Uh, and looking for the African broadbill. It's quite a rare bird in, in southern Africa. Not so rare up in north, northern Africa, depend, or north and east Africa, depends where you are. And uh, when I first moved into the Salu Game Reserve in, in southern Tanzania, I was building my, we built the camp from scratch, which is always an incredible experience. Uh, I was building my 
chose my spot to put up my tent, which I lived in for a couple of years. And I say tent, it was 12 meters long, on suite bathroom. It was a proper big tent. And uh, set up my tent. And I think first or second morning I'd stayed in my tent. One of the birds that a lot of bird watchers go uh, out of their way and spend a lot of money and time trying to see is the African bird in South Africa. It's uh, my first morning. Oh, morning, Vilbeets. Vilbeets, it's your brethren. For those of you are not sure, Vildebeest uh, is VM's nickname because I think he filmed the first live Vildebeest bird. Is that correct? Yeah, well. There we go. That's how VM got his nickname, the Vildebeest. So that African broadbill we're talking about, and I was having my cup of tea out on my balcony at about four, or outside the front of my tent at about four in the morning, and this little African, I could hear them calling, and they often call in the dusk and dawn. It was calling so close to me, and as it got more light, literally this bird was sitting not even a meter from me and doing its display. And for a little brown bird, it's got a very big voice and a very extensive display. But we'll chat about that a little bit more. I'm trying to count how many baby wildebeest there are. So there were 10 before I went on leave. And according to Jamie and Scott, uh, there are still 10. So isn't that wonderful? The wildebeest are doing a good job. So they've got a little bit older now. They're a bit faster. So a little bit harder to catch for the lions and leopards. But obviously still being a youngster, it's there is a possibility, but great to know that the Vildies are doing well. And we'll be very happy with that burst of rain we've had and quite a lot of nice new grass. Now, there's a nice little one coming off to the right there. And there we go. You can see the little horns poking out. And uh, they actually, although they're already eating grass, these young youngsters, they actually suckle for quite a long time for, for, for a, uh, a herbivore. They suckle for, for up to eight months. And if a female wildebeest has had a calf last year, then, so basically it's a year old, uh, or eight months to a year old when they have the next set, um, if, if she loses that newborn calf to a predator, she will often suckle the previous year's calf uh, for another sort of eight, nine months. So sometimes a, a lucky calf, if it's, it's, its future or brother and sister gets eaten, will get the bonus of another, another sort of season's worth of milk. And it's going to be fun. In a few months, we're going to watch the wildebeest rutting. And so they, like Impala, have a very fixed breeding cycle. And when they do rut, it is quite comical. Uh, to see the goings, the ongoings, and the flirt, flirtings of the females and the, the males trying to chase all the other males away, and the snorting and general chaos that ensues. There you go, it's too hot. That's the, these little guys have decided, you know what, we don't have to eat grass all the time. We've got mother's milk, so we can just chill. scratching of themselves. Let's leave the wildebeests. Uh, Vim, do you want to go join them? No, I'll go later. Uh, Vim's going to go graze with them a little bit later. So, Debbie says, wow, Brent, you lived in a tent. Uh, strangely enough, Debbie, for the last 10 years, I've probably spent uh, probably about six or seven living in a tent. This non-living in a tent is quite a new thing for me. It's quite nice to have four walls. But uh, no, I've, I've lived in a tent. And strangely enough, when my family first moved up to Botswana, our whole family, mum, dad, brother, and my brother and myself, lived in a group of tents. So we had two big tents, and, and we used to live in the tents. So uh, while we, when we first started the safari, or well, my dad first started the safari business up in Botswana. But we're chatting about that African board bull, one of my most memorable birds. So I'm just gonna give you a quick view and a saying, 
a lot of a lot of birds and a lot of males in general go to great lengths to impress a female. And I think that's one of the things I love about the African board bull is the great lens. This tiny little brown brown bird goes to to impress the ladies. Let's see, there you go. So very. Oh, I'm pushing up. There we go. So there is a very sort of dull and brown, but when he's displaying for the ladies, so you have that incredible, and it's loud. And basically what he does is he sits on a branch like this, and he flies round and round the branch as he calls. So wait for it. And then he lands back in the same spot. So he goes onto the same spot. And that's how he impresses the girls. So really, 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 really cool. And that's why I said, for me, it's possibly not the, not the, the memory of the specific bird memory. It's, it's, it's the sighting in, 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 in total. Like, and I had some amazing sightings in general in Tanzania. Um, working in a really, really rare, I uh, mean, really, really interesting area. And uh, we went from over a thousand meters above sea level down to about um, 200 meters above sea level. So we went from mountains and, and, and remnant rainforest to grassland and savannah to river Rhine forest. And we saw lots of incredible birds there. And uh, one of, probably one of the least birded areas in the world and uh, I'm quite proud of myself I managed to get some sort of little spots in the bird books that had never been recorded there before and here's another beautiful little bird A little yellow-eyed canary. Look at that little guy. Pretty little bird. A little seed eater. So it feeds mostly of grass seeds. Beautiful little one. There's another one for the list, guys. Yellow-eyed canary. Pretty, pretty. And fortunately, we don't treat our canaries uh, like the miners used to. And I'm sure quite a lot of you know that, but so canaries are very sensitive to, to lack of oxygen or to, to methane. So miners used to take canaries down into the, the mines uh, with, in their cages. And then the canaries start singing or passed out it was time to get out of dodge so they would make sure they got out of the mines and that was their sort of safety uh, safety quite strange their safety net was a canary canaries in a cage to make sure they didn't expire while underground so i, I didn't quite catch that but someone says i i should get jamie my girlfriend to buy me a new pair of pants and this actually happened this morning guys this is this is Bozo the clown says I should get Jamie to buy me a new pair of pants. So this this actually happened this morning, and and these were whole pants. And unlike the hipsters, I definitely didn't buy my pants with with, with a hole in them. Uh, that happened from wear and tear. So final control is going to get into big trouble shortly. They're saying I've got long hair, a man bun, torn pants. I must be a hipster. I am definitely not a hipster. I lack the, the lumberjack shirts and, and, and the bushy beard. And that little hat. And the little hat that doesn't actually stop the sun getting on your face. It's just there to look pretty. Right? I, I, I'm, I won't lie, hipsters annoy me a little bit. Is it going to be kind to us for him? Probably not. Uh, not. What was that? African monarch butterfly that fluttered off. So I was hoping that Kula might have made a surprise appearance in this area. So just checking around here for tracks. Look at that. 
Lovely. Not often you see, oh, um, they run off together. There were two of them. As I said, there's not often you see a pair, a pair of Steenbock together. A pair of disappearing Steenbock, or one stopped, but in the most inopportune position for us to view them. And we'll carry on. One of the few monogamous antelope we get out here. And they will stay as a couple till one is eaten by a leopard. Then only will they look for a replacement. And a very firm favorite food of the leopard. You can see here there's been overnight. Big herd of Ellie's and they've dug up some roots there and looks like they actually spent quite a bit of time here. They could have even sort of dozed during the night here and you can just see they flatten the ground in this after the rain, the soft sand in this area. And they've really made a nice little spot for themselves there. But if we look at the dung, you can see, as I said, it's probably from last night. And I'm saying that because you can see some of the, the, the soil starting to get white on the edges from the sun and, and drying, and the dung has been completely processed uh, by dung beetles already. So just come off to the left a little bit, will you? There we go. You can see how some of the soil is becoming white, but it is still quite dark. And that dung, although fresh, has been completely processed. The dung beetles have taken the balls out of it. And you must remember, not only the dung beetles that roll the balls are, are there, there's dung beetles that actually will dig in and then take their dung to, to lay their eggs in straight below where that dung is. I'm hoping we do see some Ellie's this morning. I do love spending time with Ellie's. So I think I'm going to head up towards the northwest with those monster elephant paths that crisscross through the Juma, and maybe we'll find an Ellie utilizing those paths. Wonderful to be back in the hot seat, so to speak. Love being out here and love being on drive with you guys. Cats are hiding. And it is great to see after this rain that a lot of these little mud wallows or pans have water in, water in them. So hopefully we'll find some elephants sp splashing and spraying mud about. There we go. And of course the buffalo bulls are the first to take advantage of every bit of mud that they can wallow in. There's a buffalo bull already standing in this mud wallow. And a nice big herd of zebra around as well. So, there we go. I'm always feeling a bit shy about bathing in the mud. I'm sure you'll move back in there. So you have a look at these zebra. You quite often see zebra standing like that, bum to head, and there's a very good reason for it. So the tail swishing will keep the fly away from the other zebra's head uh, and vice versa. So that's why you quite often see zebras standing with their heads, heads in opposite directions, and it's to try to keep the flies away from each other. There we go, taking a drink from that pan, Diana Hill says she's just noticed that zebra don't have stripes on the inside of their legs. Uh, Diana, if you have a closer look, and VM's going to show you there, 
their eye stripes on the inside, they're just quite faded. Some of them don't go all the way through, some of them do, but as you can see on that back leg there, uh, they're not as prominent. So, but there are stripes, they're just not as prominent. There are gaps between the stripes, of course, but uh, there are some stripes. And uh, for those of you wondering where we are, we're at the junction of Treehouse and Shabaum. And uh, I think, ah, I think I can spot Brett through the trees, who's got a fascinating little reptile to show you. Welcome back, everybody. I think you saw us just uh, going by in your screens, and you've linked over to us. We've got a flat-necked chameleon. Look how he walks. Look how he raises his leg and then wobbles. Shaking. Like a leaf in the wind, I believe Scott showed you a chameleon just a few days back and talked about the way they walk he's gone into the grass let's watch him come out the other side also look at that amazing coloration which he has changed now as he crosses the road we've seen the colors change and him get a little bit darker it on behind the grass will come out again this is a flap-necked chameleon very susceptible in the open road as it crosses. It's just crossed the open road and got into some cover. So it's just um, kind of taking a breather there. You can see now Andrew panning out. He's crossed this whole open area. Extremely susceptible when they cross there. Can easily get munched. Um, just having a look at the chameleon. And coming back to me while he's be behind that tuft of grass. Uh, we'll, we'll see him come out Hello. and have a look at his uh, colors. Good morning. Good morning. So amazing how they do change color and a lot of people uh, often associate it with camouflage but a lot of the time chameleons change their color it's also to do with their mood and what's happening in their life but what he did here is he as he crossed the road he made a lot of dark dark spots all over the body in order to help him camouflage dappled light as they cross makes themselves very thin whenever i see them crossing roads they make themselves very very thin they move in that kind of rocking motion like this yeah. in the shitsonga tradition they call them long fun meaning old man and has to do, has to do with the the way they walk highly revered in shangan tradition um, and as scott mentioned to you the other day possibly it has to do with camouflage and as they move like that it's like a leaf shaking in the wind help to to camouflage him as he moves along the road i'm not sure if he's come out there again or he's just disappeared right inside the grass probably knows that he's safe there i don't see it having come out let me just move the vehicle have a look obviously they are masters of camouflage some zero old buffalo bull walking 30 meters away from us in the background and a dazzle of zebra also just through the bush okay i believe you were having a look at them and that's when you saw us the, i don't see the chameleon do you no negative no and that's why they call him the master of camouflage yeah Amazing how he just disappears. We know he was there. Come past now, you'll never know. Sandblaster on YouTube. You're right, he does need some, uh, some music. We all know the song. Andrew's gonna sing it for us now. Anybody just hold on for that. Come, 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 and go. Nice. He was doing his little dance. Beautiful, Andrew. Thank you for that. I just want to have one last look for him there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sandblaster. I hope you're singing along back at home. And that's how a chameleon disappears underneath a tuft of old sickle bush.
unbelievable actually how it just disappeared I'm, I'm glad we got the last of that that guy crossing the crossing the road there we will wander on and leave him to be I don't want to give away his his position they are great meals also and and you might think it's only birds that's that spot them there when they're crossing the road but i have actually seen a, a twig snake a vine snake watching a flat neck chameleon cross the road out of nowhere a vine snake had obviously spotted he lives in the trees came down onto the road and grabbed that chameleon a vine snakes uh, and worm slungs are are major predators of chameleons. They all live in the same habitat in the trees. That's the flat neck chameleon, and they're major predators of them. And uh, so it's, it's not only birds who's going to spot them as they as they cross roads like that, but snakes as well. And the vine snake and the wormsong are famous for their vision. Two snakes which have fantastic vision, binocular vision. We've, we've, what we've, we've seen some giraffe up ahead in the road from where we were sitting when we first spotted that chameleon. We're gonna make our way slowly down there and see if we can catch up with those giraffe. They were just over the rise. We've got um, two marabou storks, the reputed to be the world's ugliest birds on the left here. I know Jamie, you saw two with Jamie last night. Two marabou storks, taking it easy. I know and I, and I have seen it in further north of this area in the last few weeks where we have had an influx of marabou stalks. They are very famous as scavengers, They've got that bald head so they can stick it inside of carcasses just like a vulture. And they're here for the drying water and the catfish, I believe you, they're moving back in and what they're doing right now is moving up and down the Kruger National Park just looking for dry water sources. That's really what I've seen them doing for the past six or eight weeks and uh, I've seen them also having fantastic interactions with the African fish eagles and just last week I actually saw an African fish eagle stand up to a marabou stalk and the marabou stalk had flown in and stolen the fish eagle's fish, kleptoparasitic behavior and the fish eagle actually came back and stole the, the fish back out of the marabou stalk's beak with its talons, it was incredible. Kind of like undertakers that they, as they sit there in the top of the tree waiting for somebody to perish in this dry time that we're in but really just feeding on the catfish and tilapia and frogs which are stuck in the in the drying pools right now you can see their legs are very very white there and that's actually not the real color of their legs i guess you might have heard this before some of you but they defecate onto their legs and that cools them down thermoregulation an amazing interesting method of thermoregulation as they stand up there in the breeze. Look at that hammer-like beak. The place that Scott and I once visited Nairobi together and what really amazed me about walking around the capital city of Kenya was you have these guys sitting on top of the street poles and the traffic lights. You drive around when you're with your sunroof open and the next minute a branch fell through our roof a big piece of branch from the acacias right on the main highway in nairobi and that's because the marabou stalk had just adjusted position above our car amazing things to find in a in a big city there are loads of these guys in nairobi the capital city of kenya and that was with scott these two waiting for somebody to perish let's trundle on down the road and see if we can find those giraffe Yeah, you never know what's around with these these two marabou stalks like vultures. It's always good to have a look around when they are perched in a tree. It might just be their resting place. It's a big old dead tree, which is suitable for them to sit. Often areas where they sit, you'll have white on the branches. I've seen that regular perches of these stalks as we go past. That's an interesting looking thing. See if we can find these giraffe. Nice to see the marabou stalks.
wander on down the road and there were a couple of giraffes who strolled across. It was probably 10 minutes ago now. But let's have a look. question from YouTube from Samur. Thanks very much for your question. You're asking, what is the biggest bird seen in Africa? It's a great question. And like with all things, it, are we talking about biggest in terms of weight, in terms of wingspan, in terms of height off the ground? Now, the Mar marabou stalk is a very, very tall bird. And it probably, I would guess, stands about five feet high, which is very tall. But often what we call the biggest bird in Africa, the stop and talk is called the Cory Bustard. Now that's not a nasty word to say, spelled B-U-S and Cory, K-O-R-I. That is known as the heaviest flying bird in Africa. It has a cousin in Europe called the Great Bustard. They very similar weights. Cory Bustards have been weighed up to 19 kilograms, 19 and a half kilograms. Usually they probably weigh a bit less. We do find them in the Kruger Park, further east, further south. They're like big open plains, and that's the heaviest flying bird in Africa. The largest bird, most of you will know, the largest bird in the world is the ostrich. They are flightless, but it is the largest bird in the world, the ostrich. We find them in the Kruger Park. They very seldom pass through the Sabi Sands. I'm not sure how often or if ever they've been seen here on Safari Live. Uh, so one of our viewers will surely be able to tell us. But we do see ostriches passing through irregularly. They like the same habitat as the Cory Bustards. Big open areas, extremely fast and very, very heavy. They can weigh over 40 kilograms. An ostrich, or over 80 pounds, massive bird. Uh, and the largest bird in the world, the common ostrich. The largest bird in Africa, flightless. The largest bird which can fly or heaviest is the Cory Bustard. Let's carry on looking for those giraffe. information and I believe there was an ostrich scene but many years back. I must say in my five years that I guided in the Sabi Sands, I think I remember seeing ostrich twice. Two completely different areas and that is, like I said earlier, the beauty of being in an open system. These animals move through. You come around the corner, there's an ostrich. We've got some beautiful giraffe here on both sides of the vehicle. I'll leave it up to Andrew where he's going to go. He is a champion. You've got mom and baby coming across the road here. Yeah. I'll just leave you in silence to watch them cross the road. Little guy having a look at us. Very curious. Beautiful. Look how they walk. Fantastic. Let me just slide forward here. Such relaxed creatures. Little guy back in the road. This way here. Hello, little fellow. He's curious. We're watching him from all over the world on YouTube, on Wild Earth Safari Live. And this little giraffe is watching you. He's looking right into you through your computer or in your TV screen, wherever you are. Who's watching who in the zoo? Thanks, little fellow. And is that a boy or a girl? Some of you might have seen as he turned. I'll maybe give you another chance to have a look, see if you can guess for yourself. It's disappeared there now. Look at that camouflage. You think the tallest, tallest mammal in the world won't disappear, but look how that little thing disappeared. There's another adult female moving back towards the road. We're going to get a great view now. Walking like a camel, spotted like a leopard. Both legs on the left, both legs on the right. Fantastic locomotion. Moving forwards just like the snail, but a little different. Slide on 
forward. I've asked earlier my favorite animals and I've got to say giraffe are up there in the top 10. I absolutely love them. Curious, gentle, totally unique in the world. Nothing else like a giraffe. It's our little friend. What a beautiful shot of us and the giraffes. Fantastic. Nice to have them in the background. Mom and baby giraffe. Mom's just bent over there eating on the buffalo thorn. Look at the little guy rubbing up against his mom. Hi, Sharon in Pittsburgh, and thanks for joining us here with the giraffe. Thanks for welcoming me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you watching. Fantastic interaction there. There's a young male giraffe, for those of you who did identify the sex, rubbing up against his mom. Just fantastic. Sharon's asking me what made me want to audition for Safari Live and isn't this technology fantastic? Sharon, the technology is incredible. And when I sat in the control room yesterday afternoon, I was absolutely amazed. For somebody who's not that tech savvy, it's uh, phenomenal what the ladies in the back Kirsty and Nikki are doing and what Andrew can do on a computer and these these cameras are just fantastic it's a it's so great to be involved with with this camera equipment and all of well, all of this this equipment that Safari Live has the links the all the technology that's on this vehicle the antennas the cameras the even all the extensions the cables the things in my ear it's incredible the the technology and the fact that I can stream this big bull giraffe on the road here at Juma this morning to your house in Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania or Arizona, Texas. It's incredible. Look at the little guy chewing on his tail. That is hilarious. And he has a little scratch there. Oh, he's really hungry. But um, I think he was trying to get rid of a parasite on his tail. Fantastic. What made me audition for Safari Live? I tell you, my friend Scott Dyson. I saw what a blast he was having. He, he came and visited me not, a, not long ago, and I was inspired. It's uh, something different. It's a challenge. As I said, it's not easy being in front of the camera, so it's just a challenge, something different, and something great to do, something new in my guiding career. Um, and it's nice to drive this little Land Rover around in a new place. So thanks, Sharon, for your question. I hope I answered it. Let's move on forward and have another look at the giraffe. Beth, nice to have you with us, Sharon. And uh, it's nice to be out here. Insomniac on YouTube. I'm not sure I got exactly where you live and you say I love to look, wake up and look out my window and see a giraffe and I tell you that is what it's all about. Having grown up in the city of Gold, Johannesburg, uh, where there is a lot of traffic and a lot of noise, it's an absolute privilege to be out here where our alarm clock is the Franklins. And this morning I woke up in the pitch dark and I had a shower. The birds were starting to call and it is a privilege. No sirens, no constant humdrum of traffic. The silence of just watching this giraffe browsing. It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege. That's why I love living where we do. And this is our office and waking up with the dawn chorus. It is a privilege and it's so important that we protect these places of, on the planet and that we can still have places where you can wake up, open your window and see a giraffe. Here we are watching them browse, eating leaves. Hi, Joe in Arizona. 
Thank you so much for your question. It's a great question. You're talking about, I mentioned I'd been in Tanzania. I was there in 2012 for about six months. And you're asking if I'd been to Tarangire National Park. Now, actually, I haven't, Joe. So, great question. I know a little bit about it, Tarangire National Park. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been there. And... You talk about the white giraffe that's there now. Actually, I have come across that giraffe that you talk about in Tarangiri, and I saw on social media it has been seen recently, and you're saying it's not an albino now. You probably know a little bit more about it, but I saw that that giraffe had seen some year, been seen some years back, and recently what had happened, they'd seen it again. Now, Tarangiri, like a lot of parks in Tanzania, it is seasonal. They don't operate there in the wet season. They operate there in the dry season and it's too wet to move around and um so I think for the last few months they weren't there and they've gone in there and seen this giraffe again. It is leucistic, you are correct. Leucism is the, uh, the lack of the dark pigment, lack of melanin or black pigment. So those giraffes, like many creatures in a lot of reserves throughout Africa, are not albino. So they do have melanin pigment in certain parts of their body, underneath their feet, on their lips, on their noses, etc but they have lost most of the dark pigment. So in these areas, we do get leucistic or white dacre, stienbuck. Every now and then an impala pops out or a giraffe, and that leucistic or white giraffe in Tarangiri National Park in Tanzania has become very famous. It has lost most of the dark pigment. As we look at this giraffe, that brown coloration all over its body, even up on top of the ossicones, the black there is caused by the melanin pigment, a dark pigment, gives it that darker coloration. And these animals have, have, have through genetics, it's a gen genetic variation, lost that dark pigment. Joe, I hope I've, I've answered your question. Haven't been to Tarangiri National Park, hope to one day. And I think you're spot on with that white giraffe. It's a condition, a recessive, a recessive condition coming from from genetics coming from its mother and father called leucism we, it, we, we get it in quite a lot of birds here as well let's uh, wander on a little bit let's see if that big bull giraffe is down there now connecting that to something which the Kruger Park is very very famous for is the white lions and those are technically leucistic again they've lost the dark pigment or the more tawny color and where you really see the lack of pigment in the lions and I think all of you at home know the lions on the back of their ears and on the tip of the tail is black and white lions have no dark pigment there. A white lion or a white giraffe is also known as a leucistic or the condition is called leucism, the lack of dark pigment. Chop just last now for this giraffe, just through the branches there. You can see the little guy. And he's got quite a lot of melanin, a lot of dark pigment, a lot of darker animals. Many of you have seen giraffe before will know they come in all sorts of variations of color. It comes from mom and dad, and the genes. Just like us, our skin color is different between different individuals. And that was the giraffe. Great to see them. And... Uh, interesting question from Lisa in Wisconsin. Thanks so much for getting in touch and me just being here this morning. It's great information that you're giving me there, uh, Lisa, about how long will this male giraffe follow the female? And I believe this, this that he's been following her for a very long time, maybe even since December. Now that's really interesting because 
to the best of my knowledge, they don't really follow them for a very long time. Giraffes have a loose social structure and a male will come in, associate with a female as she moves past, say hello, spend the day with her and then wander on. Unless, of course, she's coming into her estrus cycle or coming into heat, in which case the male will then hang around. How does he know that? He knows that through chemicals in her urine and in the air which she's releasing, which he can pick up but we can't. Now, if a female is coming into estrus cycle and she wants to mate soon, the male picks up, up through chemicals and pheromones and he says, hi, hi I'm going to hang around. I'm not going to leave this female. If you have a female coming into estrus like that, you'll also, oh, as the days go by, day one, two, three, four, have a congregation of males around all the big daddies in the area they pick up that smell they come and enjoy and, and and get attracted and get attracted to that female and wander into the area and then the males start competing for mating rights now the interesting thing is you are telling me that that male has been trailing a female for quite a long time a relatively very long time as giraffe social structure as we know it goes but the thing is that there's no other males around this morning or from the feedback that I'm getting so if she's coming into her estrus cycle or wants to mate which is why that male is staying longer with her I would expect there to be one or two other mature adult male giraffes around if she's coming into estrus because that's where really, really what happens and these mammals out here, they don't miss a thing like that. So I can't answer your question, why has he been hanging around with her for so long? It's very interesting. And I wonder that myself. I wonder the same as you. Why has he been doing that? The question is, maybe there are periods when he's leaving her and moving around alone and we not picking that up on Safari Live. And when we're seeing them again a few days later, he's back with her. Maybe he's hanging with her all the time. And rule number one in the bush, giraffes don't read books. I read books, and that tells me that a giraffe has a very loose social structure. And I once read in a great book, we've got some kudu on our right-hand side here, so I'll just stop and we'll have a look at these beautiful creatures while I carry on talking, see if Andrew can get them. Um, now, that big male giraffe, his social structure, he's not territorial, and he didn't read the book that says he doesn't hang around with the females all the time. Possibly it's just for company. Lisa, I'm sorry I can't answer your question better than that. And it's really interesting. I'd like to see in the coming weeks, does he hang around with them more than usual? Very interesting. As we switch over to the kudu, I know you've seen some this morning. Also browsers and filling a different niche to the giraffe, eating the leaves at a different level in the canopy. Beautiful white stripes, disruptive coloration, disrupting the outline of the body. And I think, uh, let's link over to Brent. He's got some starlings having a bath. I hope that they are still there as these kudu move into the thicker bush and disappear with their disruptive coloration. Over to you, Brent. So there we go. Some, oh, oh, off they go. Oh, look, that's why I look up, up there and there's a little hammer falcon. That's why they took off. Nice for him. There's a really nice little bird. Oh, there he goes, an hammer falcon. And now they have just arrived because of this rain. That's the first one I've seen in the Sabi Sands, uh, actually in the low felt this wet season. I'm a falcon, a really great little bird um, for the bird lists for everyone. And I think on this. Fortunately, where we're sitting at the moment is a. Uh, there we go. Number three, an Amma Falcon. Looks like a little female as it zooted across. But 
There we go. And the starlings are back. But I was wondering why they took off. And as they took off, uh, we spotted that little falcon flying past. But there we go. Cape glossy starlings enjoying the standing water that's around. So even though an amaphalcon is unlikely to feed off a bird, they are very much insectivores normally. Always a little starling fight going on. Oof, off they go. One left, runs straight back to the water. He almost tries to hop over, but then walks into the middle, having a little drink. You can see that wonderful iridescence shining, that beautiful orange eye. Boop. Scuttle, scuttle. So while we've got this wonderful view of these Cape Glossy Starlings, having a bath and a puddle in the road, Kathy in Michigan would like to know, can you please help me to understand the difference between a Birchall's and a Cape Glossy? So the, the Birchall's doesn't have the same quite of sort of greenish... Anybody going past um, the, to the Missy Pio? Greenish iridescence that the, the Glossies have. They're sort of a much darker blue. Oh, look at that, really loving that. I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots of this. Oh, off it goes. And actually, I'm just up to the right slightly. There's a, on that little quarry, that one there. There's a little European roller on the left-hand branch. Here we go, another beautiful bird. But uh, so, Kathy. So, also the very, the very easiest way, if you say, if you're watching the Juma camp, to tell the difference between the Cape Glossies and the and 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 the Birchels is look at the eye. They've got a black eye. Uh, the Birchels and the Cape Glossies have that wonderful bright orange eye. Uh, we're going to continue checking. I want to go check this sort of western corner for elephants. But while we do that, uh, let's go back to Mr. Hawley, um, who's with some striped donkeys. Welcome back, folks, and thanks very much, Brent. We are looking at the rear end of a zebra. Got a really nice herd. They were out in the open. They're just slowly moving south past us. This looks to be the stallion closer to us. What I want to do is reverse and see if we can get them crossing the road. The old the zebra crossing, they call it. The cheesiest uh, guy's joke out there, but we'll throw it out anyway. Big Apple, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Carol's asking what languages do I speak? It's a great question, thank you very much. Now, I, uh, I grew up speaking English, my home language and my first language is English. Growing up in South Africa at school, at that stage we did Afrikaans as a second language. Afrikaans, which is uh, kind of similar to Dutch and Flemish. And I have had the fortune to marry a beautiful Afrikaans woman. And so my Afrikaans in the last few years has really gotten a lot better, although her friends might not say that. And so I could say I understand Afrikaans very well. I try to speak it and it really has improved. Now, fortunately, living in the bush, growing up in South Africa, I have a wonderful upbringing and have been exposed to quite a few of the other of South Africa's 11 official languages. And the, the language spoken by the people in this area, as some of you will know, is Shangan or Shitsonga. And I always say I speak Safari Shangan. So I can speak uh, Safari Shangan 
or Shitsonga. I have enough to get away with. I have enough to go into a shop and surprise the people behind the counter and impress them as everybody knows you speak somebody's language and they always like that a lot so i've, I've really tried a lot to learn shangan i'm certainly nowhere near fluent but I, I i like to think i can speak a little bit of it i also did zulu as a subject at school and shangan and zulu stem from one original language and are quite similar so i can throw out a bit of shangan a bit of zulu and living in Botswana, I learned a couple of words in Setswana. So also, again, Safari Setswana, the names of the animals, how to say good morning and good night, etc. And that is about it. Having Safari guided, I uh, can also say good morning in a few European languages. So, guten Morgen to everybody in Germany. Wie geht's? The zebra in the dappled light there now, grazing away. What a creature. We heard some Birchall's starlings very early this morning as the sun was breaking. This is the Birchall's zebra, both first described by a French naturalist, William Birchall. I don't think it's pronounced like that in French, but interesting that we've seen these two creatures. We'll slide forward and see if we can get that foal is disappearing into the back. Andrew zooming in there and the little guy disappears. Mom's got a beautiful pattern on her tail there. Nice and unique. Always fun looking for the unique spots on a zebra's body. Each one of them with a totally different pattern. You can see the shadow stripe, the brown shadow stripe, characteristic of the virtual zebra of southern Africa. Ranger has a comment, a very valid comment. Is there penance to be paid when making a cheesy joke? X Ranger, I'd like to tell you that um, it's going to be uncomfortable for me around the breakfast table this morning, and Brent will not let me get away with that. <laughs> there are definitely fines for cheesy jokes. That is for sure. Thanks for your comments. That will be a fine for me. We've got a question from Safari on Twitter. Got a nice name, Safari. Thank you very much for your question. You're asking, am I on Instagram? I am, only very recently. I've got an Instagram page called Brett Hawley Safaris. Go and check it out. Posting daily updates, beautiful shots. As I said, I'm not that tech savvy, but trying to keep up with the whole world of social media. Just a reminder, you can catch Safari Live on all kinds of social media channels. Check me out on Instagram. I have to post a picture of myself and Andrew for my Safari Live trial game drive. Don't forget everybody, hashtag Safari Live, baby. Your questions, comments, queries, throw that hashtag in there. We just reverse. Okay. All right. So we don't have much time left this morning. Let's uh, have another little wander around and see what nature can throw us with us for much longer. Make the most of it, folks, wherever you are. Hi, Zoe in Twitter. Thanks very much for sending through your question. You're asking, what's one of the most interesting things, uh, sightings that you've had? 
out in the bush? Now, that's a great question. And as you all know, you do your time out here, you spend your time, and incredible things are going to happen. I have been fortunate to, to see some phenomenal things. Um, there are one or two that always come to mind. I'll go back to often, you know, the things that we remember is usually when nature is, is at, its, at its rawest, at its most fearsome. And when I, I was actually not a guy guiding yet, I was a young boy. We were in the Timbavati Game Reserve many, many years ago on a game drive. And it's amazing how your memories are triggered by small things. Now, I remember my father was driving, my uncle was in the passenger seat, and there was a wasp flying around his legs. And this is nature at its very best. We stopped so he could open the door and the wasp could fly out. When we stopped, and Scott and Brent will, will tell you this, and James as well, you stop and nature gives you a clue. We stopped and we heard the most incredible noises. <laughs> Something was being killed. We weren't sure what. We slowly drove in there, and what we found was not what we expected. We thought maybe it was a Daker being killed, but we weren't sure, and we immediately assumed that an a leopard had, had grabbed it, and that was the noise that was emanating. When we came round the corner in a dry riverbed, we found an African rock python busy coiling itself around a fully grown adult female impala. It was incredible. And what we saw there will stick with me forever, something that I probably won't see again. I have, for a second time, seen a python with an adult male impala, who, which he had killed, but then couldn't get his mouth around the horns because the impala was lying in a specific direction. Going back to this sighting that had a massive impact on me and as, as a young boy, an African rock python. It was busy constricting an adult female impala. Now, I only remember the time of year because there was a tiny baby impala sitting, standing next to this whole scene. It was a bit much for all of us on the vehicle. The little baby impala was literally standing three feet away. The mother was still alive at that stage, and it took the python 45 minutes. And it was interesting what we saw that night. Every time the impala bleated out, bleh, the python would squeeze tighter. It still had its jaws locked onto the upper side of that impala. As, as an anchor, and it had wrapped itself around every time it would move. So we didn't see the catch, but we got there. It can't have been a few minutes in. And two hours later, we left. For 45 minutes, it constricted that impala. Every time it breathed out, bah. And like you all know, some of you have seen some crazy things on this show. They're not always nice, but it's nature at its rawest that we saw. And slowly, it started to unfurl. It knew that, that that Impala was dead after about 45 minutes. The baby was still standing there, right next to it, also bleating every now and then. It was very sad. When the python started to swallow that Impala, my memory doesn't serve me very well there. The adrenaline was pumping. My father, my uncle, who had also spent their lives in the bush and being on game drives, nobody had ever seen anything like that, and we won't again. But let me tell you what we saw the next morning. We saw an Impala giving birth, and that is the circle of life. 12 hours earlier, we had seen an impala getting constricted by an African rock python. It was incredible. And the next morning, we were witness to an impala giving birth. That's the circle of life. That is nature at its very best. That is ecology, ecosystems. That is nature controlling these places. And I must tell you, we did all feel a lot better after that. It was one of those sightings that leaves you you know, later that night, you you, a bit, you kind of you have a strange feeling. You obviously want to tell everybody. Those were before the days of social media. There were no hashtags and posts that night, um, but there probably would have been because we always want to share these things with people. But it was a big relief for us all the next morning when another impala joined the world. So, thanks for your question, and that was one of the. One of the crazier things I've ever seen, African rock python constricting a fully grown adult female impala. Incredible. It's a big snake.
African rock pythons are very, very special creatures. They are under threat today because of habitat destruction. They are used in traditional medicine. They are killed by cars crossing the roads. They are collected. They are revered in the pet trade. And it's not often that we see the African rock python. And let me tell you that one night, here's a story. Somebody asked us about uh, stories with the boys. One night, about five years ago, a young man named Scott Dyson woke me up in my slumber and they had found an African rock python outside of the reserve where it was crossing a road. Major threat to it. You can't just leave it there. It will be killed or hit by a car. So they decided to bring it back into the reserve where it will be nice and safe. But before they did that, Scott decided it would be a good idea to wake me up at 11 o'clock at night in my fast asleep, tap on my shoulder, and then wake me up with this African rock python in my face. You can imagine I wasn't that impressed by it. My heart stopped, and that was the, probably one of the last times I saw an African rock python with my friend Scott Dyson. He was saving it from the outside world, the real world, bringing it back into the reserve. Um, and decided to wake me up with it looking into my face. Well, thanks, Scott, for that. That was a good story. I haven't ever forgiven him. But good story in that the, the African rock python... You can see it's breathing. It's just having a serious snooze in the morning sunlight. And the others are all up and around it. And we're going to sneak forward a little bit. See if he's actually... Well, she's actually heard us coming. You can see there's a foal and another one off to the left having a snooze. So, and the rest of the herd going out across here. And let's see what happens when we sneak a bit closer. Is it going to get the fight of its life? So, zebras quite often with pain and cold snaps or whatnot, they can actually die. Oh no, he's awake. Hello. So, sub adult who was catching a snooze there. And they're definitely awake now. Okay, let's just go to the bum of this one there. It looks like there might be a faint scratch mark on it. So, let's take a look. Here we go. Look at that. Someone got away from the lions. quite a while ago, judging by how those cars have healed. So, successful at evading capture, that one. Oh, no, he's having a drink. There you, go, you can see that little foal is sucking. And uh, the lazy zebra is about to walk him to shot. There we go, the one who is flat, flat against the ground having a schnooze. So, I was hoping that we could find a, a virtual starling so we can actually, after looking at those glossies, have a good look, see the difference. But of course, it's one of those birds that's everywhere when you're not looking for them nowhere where you are. Says, can zebra lock their legs um, when standing up like horses can? Uh, Jane, I, I think you sort of referring to like when you try and pull a horse or lead a horse, it just boom, almost locks the knees. Um, they can, and, and, and the same as a donkey would as well. Uh, horses are far more closely related. Uh, I mean, sorry, donkeys are far more closely related to zebras than horses. 
one is actually a wild donkey species that occurs in North Africa uh, and into uh, the um, Middle East called the wild ass. And it has faint zebra stripes on its rump. Very, very rare these days and only live really in really inhabited places in the sort of deep desert. picked up a little bit, it's to put the birds a little bit on the back burner, but hopefully we will be able to find some. Well, it has been great having Brett here, who would have thought many years ago was when I was showing him around Singita and Bombo, that we'd, either of us would be sitting here taking live drives. Got a marula nut. Squirrel, up, 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 up. Looks like it had a marula nut in his mouth. Off to find his stash. Uh, they will stash like the squirrels in North America and Europe. Uh, but because the, the weather here is so wonderful most of the year, they don't need to have those extensive stashes that, uh, that the North American and European squirrels have to keep through winter. Uh, there's, sorry, just quickly, there's two, one really brilliantly brightly coloured starling that I want to show you in this light. Um, you got him there, Bim, hopping around the top. Oh, he's gone. There it is. It's a violet-backed or plum-coloured. Oh, look at that light on it. Here we go, another one for the bird list. And busy actively feeding through that terminalia. But we'll keep an eye on him and hopefully he'll pop out into a far more open area uh, while we do that. But uh, let's go have a chat to Brett quickly before the end of show. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me out here this morning. I just want to thank you all for your wishes last night and your, your questions and comments and wishing me good luck. I felt like you were there with me throughout the world. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed it. Look forward to getting your feedback through all the social media channels. And thanks to Scotty D for getting me out here. I appreciate it. Uh, Nikki and Kirsty, been a great help in final control. I really appreciate it. Andrew's the man behind the camera, as you know, made life much easier. Big shout out to everybody out there who's been watching, who knows me, who, who, who tuned in this morning. I uh, love you all. Thanks very much for joining us and hopefully see you next time. Cheers. Just leave it wide. Or... So look at that. The two, two of the most brightly colored birds. Ooh, is that a female? Looks like it. Whoa. There we go. There's the female. You can see how dull she is in comparison to the male. But he's going to look pretty to attract her. And you can see, look at him, she 